This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, order. Uh, good afternoon, members, and welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the uh, Northern Ireland Assembly's Public Accounts Committee. We have quorum, and we are now in public session. Um, members, I must point out that mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode, as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed live by online streaming on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. So, in welcoming you to PAC's meeting today, we have two evidence sessions and will therefore be going in and out of open and closed session. Agenda item one is apologies and any delegation of votes. Can I ask the clerk if we have any apologies this afternoon? None received. Yep. Okay, there are no poli- uh, apologies or delegation of votes. Uh, agenda item two then is the minutes of the 3rd of March 2022 and the minutes of the 8th of March 2022, which are in your packs, um, pages 7 to 17 and 2 to 6. So can I ask the committee uh, for permission to sign the minutes as being a true and accurate record of those meetings? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, agenda item three then is the declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial and other interests in the members' register of interests. Today's subject matters include educational special needs and planning in Northern Ireland. So I declare an interest of the outset of the meeting as a governor of Belfast Girls Model School and Edinburgh Primary School in Belfast. Mr. Beggs. Learning as the governor of Rodensfield School in Lauren and also as a committee member of Horizon Sure Start. Any others? Uh, declaring interest as a member of Priory Integrated College Board of Governors. Okay, that's Mr. Muir. Uh, any others, members? Chair. Mr. Boylan. Yeah, member of the Board of Governors at Clay School, Katie. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so, agenda item four then, matters arising. Are there any matters arising from the minutes? Okay. Um, can I ask, can Mr. Patrick Barr be brought into the meeting? And I think Jonathan Stevenson, have you joined us, Jonathan? Good afternoon. Stuart, even as Jonathan Stevenson from another life. Yes. Good afternoon, Stuart. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, Chair. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. And can can I just ask, Kyle, are you are you able to hear me okay? Kyle, okay, not not there. You might not think Kyle is there. Dropped off. Okay, so we've uh... okay. Um, so agenda item five then is the. Correspondence, uh, pages 21 to 24 of your pack. Uh, and we're joined this afternoon by Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Controller and Auditor General for Northern Ireland, Colette Kane, Director, Roger McCants, Audit Manager, and hopefully Kyle Bingham, the Assembly Sport Officer. And we're also joined by um, Mr. Rodney Allen uh, as well. 
Um, members, I refer to correspondence dated the 4th of March 2022 in your pack, pages 21 to 23, from Edward Cook regarding Section 75 screening at Queen's University. Mr. Cook highlights the concerns in respect to recording of students' complaints, and he has also written to the Committee of Finance regarding Section 75 screening of the allocation of PhD students and the marginalisation of unionist staff and students. Um, Mr. Donnelly, have you any comment on this? Uh, yeah, Mr. Cook has also written to us and a number of other regulators. Okay. So, so we'll be <coughs> responding to him and okay. um, consulting with some of the other regulators as well before we do that. Okay. Uh, members, are you content that we note and forward um, Mr. Cook, Mr. Cook's correspondence to the Northern Ireland Oil Office and write to Mr. Cook to make him aware of our action? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 7th of March 2022 in your pack, page 24, from Alison Allen of Nilga, regarding policies and procedures of councils to lead with, to try to deal with the, any potential conflicts of interest and routine auditing of same. Ms. Allen has stated that no, she has no concerns raised, have been raised with Nilga by any party in relation to how conflicts of interest are managed for planning officers. She also comments on qualified majority voting. Are members content for the correspondence on to the audit office? Agreed. Agreed. I refer to correspondence from uh, Mike Keeley in your pack on pages 8 to 10, which he had previously sent to the Economy <coughs> Committee on the 17th of February 2022. Mr Keeley has forwarded this to the PAC to include in our broadband investment in Northern Ireland inquiry. Members, are you content to forward this to the audit office? Uh, and we include Mr Keeley's email and report and the report's appendices. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. Members, we will continue in public session for our next agenda item, uh, which is uh, ministerial direction. Uh, and can I ask at this stage if uh, we can bring in Tomas Wilkinson uh, for this agenda? Um, Tomas, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, sir. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, so, Basically, members, uh, ministerial direction, agenda item six, uh, COVID and Ex employment and skills initiative, pages 26 to 33 of your pack. Um, and I refer to correspondence in your pack at pages 26 to 27 from Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Order General, dated the 7th of March 2022, regarding a letter from the Department for Communities Permanent Secretary, Ms. Tracy Maharg, who wrote to the CNAG on the 22nd of February 2022. To advise DFC Minister Deidre Hargey, MLA, issued a ministerial direction to deliver COVID recovery programme employment and skills initiative, which cost up to £20 million. The initiative will provide funding for the next three years for grants to support individuals for not for profit organisations with costs of a variety of new or enhanced roles within the arts, heritage, creative industries, sports, and voluntary and community sectors. The initiative is being delivered by four main partners, Future Screens NI, Heritage Fund, the Rank Foundation and BBC. Members, the relevant correspondence is at your uh, pages 28 to 33 of your pack. Um, uh, Mr Donnelly will keep this matter uh, in view as the audit of 2021-22 financial statement progresses. Mr Donnelly, at this stage, do you have any comment you want to make around that? Um, well, I think key point here is uh, there was a business case for this, uh, but the uh, county officer didn't approve it because they couldn't demonstrate value for money in the time available. Uh, we certainly will be examining this expenditure in the next uh, in the next audit if, if there are any issues, and we'll come back to the committee. Okay, members content. Agreed. 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 Members, we will remain in open session for our first evidence session today. A further update on the SEN report published on the 21st of February 2021. We have had two MORs, first in April uh, 2021 and a second MOR dated 29th of October 2022. Um, so can I ask if we can bring in uh, Dr Mark Brown, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Education, and Sarah Long the uh, Chief Executive of the Education Authority. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so agenda item seven then is uh, the PAC review of special educational needs impact uh, evidence session, pages 35 to 107 of your pack. Uh, we're joined this afternoon by Dr. Mark Brown, the County Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Education, and Sir Long, the Chief Executive of the uh, uh, Education Authority. And uh, we're being joined remotely then by Ms. Una Turbert, Ricky Irwin, and Lindsay Farrell. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Can, can all of you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, I think they're all together in Bangor. No, no, no. Yes, yeah, so all good here. Um, Okay, so good afternoon, and what we'll do is, Mark, uh, sir, over to you to make a um, presentation, opening remarks, and then members will um, ask some questions. Thanks very much, Chair, um, and thanks for the opportunity to update you on the Department's Memorandum of Reply to the Committee 2021 report on the uh, Impact Review of Special Educational Needs. Uh, you've, you've mentioned the colleagues that I have uh, here today, Lindsay Farrell, who is the Head of Education Policy and Children's Services, and Ricky Irwin, who is the Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing, uh, and also, obviously, Sarah, uh, along with Una Turbot, who is the Interim Director of Children and Young People's Services. So, Firstly, Chair, I'd like to assure the Committee that both the Department and the EA are committed and continue to work together to ensure that the recommendations of the PAC report are fully addressed and that remedial actions are <coughs> implemented. Many of the recommendations are operational matters for the EA, which has already commenced a significant programme of improvement and review across all its SEN services under its SEN and Disability Strategic Development Programme, or the SEND SDP, uh, and Sarah will be happy to provide more detail and progress to date in that area. Perhaps I could just take this opportunity to give the committee a brief high-level summary of progress against each recommendation. Under recommendation one, an independent review team has been appointed and has completed stage one of the project, which is desktop research. Stage two of the project, the stakeholder engagement element, is currently underway, and the project is on track for completion by end April 2022. Under recommendation two, the tender evaluation process to appoint an external consultant to carry out an independent review of SEN service provision and processes is, is complete uh, and subject to confirmation uh, of, of the funding that we have for 2022-23 financial year, and I expect to have that funding. Uh, the contract will be awarded and commenced uh, in April with a time scale of around six months. Under recommendation three, Rigorous performance monitoring and monthly reporting processes are now in place for the statutory assessment process. Under recommendation four, following an independent review of governance arrangements and committee structure in March 2020, a new EA committee structure is in place and is working well. In respect of recommendation five, the EA's corporate data strategy has been established, which identifies high priority initiatives to improve data management and support effective business analysis and decision making. A data quality framework has been initiated to assure that data is fit for purpose and meets the needs of data consumers. And a data governance, a data governance program has uh, commenced in September 2021. Under recommendation six, part of the proposed data audits across the EA's pupil support services will focus on pupil outcomes and how to enhance analytical capabilities in the short term. The wider pupil support service reviews under the SEND SDP will include specified pupil outcome data requirements, which will inform the effectiveness of SEN interventions and their value for money. The wider pupil outcome picture will also be added to through the review of the SEN service provision and processes on <coughs> PAC recommendation two, and also the rollout of digital personal learning plans under the 2016 SEND Act. Under recommendation seven, uh, a, a report on the diagnostic analysis of SEND tribunal trends is proceeding through the EA committee approval processes and will then be considered by the SEND SDP board, program reference group and the SEN uh, governance group before publication. Overall, the department has increased its governance and accountability oversight of the EA, EA on SEN issues and continues to maintain strategic oversight of all work via monthly SEN governance group meetings, uh, which I chair. And complementary to the ongoing work I've just outlined and underpinning the drive for improvement in SEN provision, work continues to complete implementation of the new SEN framework. 
The following consultation on new SEN regulations and a new code of practice last year. Further engagement has taken place with stakeholders and we continue to work with the Departmental Solicitor's Office on a number of significant changes to take account of the feedback that has been received. And once finalised, it is anticipated that DE officials will present amended regulations to the Education Committee subject to ministerial approval. It is intended that the legislative journey will then begin later in 2022 and the provisions of the 2016 SEND Act will be commenced via a phased approach. As part of PAC Recommendation 2, uh, assessing the impact of the new <coughs> SEN framework will be taken forward by the ETI in the term following its full rollout to all schools, which is likely to be sometime in 2023. In conclusion, Chair, uh, real and significant progress has been made in the field of SEN since the NIAO published its SEN report in 2017. As we look to the future, we continue to face significant challenges, uh, not least in view of the ongoing financial pressure on the education sector as we face into imminent budget settlement uh, into an imminent budget settlement with around 366 million of pressures next year rising to around 543 million in 2024-25 uh, and those pressures will inevitably have potentially significant impact on our capacity to deliver key SEN services and our ability to implement the necessary changes to our current service delivery arrangements However, in seeking to maintain continuity of service delivery, we will continue to rely on the commitment, dedication and professionalism of our school principals, teachers and wider education workforce. Thank you, Chair. I now hand over to Sarah for her opening remarks and we'll be happy to take questions after that. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to provide a further update on this very important issue driving forward the transformation of Northern Ireland's SEN system remains a central priority for the EA, its corporate leadership team and the EA board. There has been much work undertaken since the NIAO report of 2020 and the subsequent PAC report last year, and it is fair to say that the EA and the wider system has been on a journey of improvement. Significant progress has been made, but there is still much more to be done. The establishment of the SEND Strategic Development Programme has been a major step forward in bringing the many complex strands of this work together in a strategic and holistic way. It has also allowed us to strengthen our engagement and partnership working with the establishment of the Programme Reference Group, which brings together the voices of parents, children and young people, key advocacy groups and our wider education and health colleagues. As the Permanent Secretary has highlighted, significant additional investment will be necessary in order to fully deliver the vital changes at both systemic and school level which are still required. This includes sustaining our progress in improving the statutory assessment process, introducing new evidence-based intervention models, tracking the outcomes of those interventions more effectively and ultimately delivering the high quality services that our children and young people need and deserve. This is something that the EA, together with all of our partners, are absolutely committed to doing. And if we look back two years to the publication of the NIAO report in 2020, significant changes in the SEN system are already evident. An ambitious improvement project was put in place to drive forward significant transformation in the statutory assessment process. This has included revising the process itself in terms of decision making, quality assurance, information flows and standard operating procedures, improving the management information systems, analytics and reporting, rolling out a revised procedural handbook and professional development programme. And all of this work has allowed us to reduce the backlog of assessment cases which had been open for more than 26 weeks from over 1,000 at the end of November 2019 to zero at the end of March 2021. Despite significant increases in referrals over the last year, we have been able to largely maintain this compliance, and at the end of February 2022, 11 cases had been open for more than 26 weeks. Whilst this is one part of a much bigger picture, Nevertheless, the assessment process is in a much better place and we are working hard to sustain that and to build on this progress. 
Looking at other areas, we have driven forward our corporate performance framework and our data governance strategy right across the EA, with expert teams in place improving performance management across all our services. As part of this work, the statutory assessment process was prioritised across 2021, leading to substantial improvements in the quality of data analysis and reporting, which in turn have driven the wider service improvements. These same teams are currently initiating similar work across our SEN pupil support services. In preparation for the current school year, a cross-directorate project was established within the EA to tackle the significant increases in demand for special school and specialist mainstream provision. This project allowed £21 million of additional investment to be secured and an additional 61 special school classes and 39 specialist mainstream classes to be provided. This intensive work ensured that every child or young person with a statement of special educational needs was offered an appropriate placement for September 2021. This work now continues, focusing on meeting additional increases in demand for September 2022. And looking to the long-term provision, we are delighted to have launched our consultation in January on our draft Special Education Strategic Area Plan for 2022-27. This is the first regional plan to specifically focus on creating a special education system for the future that can offer all pupils the opportunity to achieve their full potential by having the best educational experiences and pathways to meet their individual needs. We recognise that there is still a significant amount of work to do and sustaining progress is always challenging, but we are absolutely committed to continuing this transformation journey to ensure we meet the needs of all our children and young people and give them the best educational opportunities and start in life. This remains an absolute priority for the Education Authority and all of our partners. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask those who are joining us remotely to mute their devices? Throughout those two presentations, it sounds as if Jack Clouseau was uh, joining us. Uh, for, for the meeting, so if you could just mute your devices and obviously unmute when you're, when you're called to speak. Uh, four members then, just the, the briefing paper is at page 30, pages 35 to 40. For those who are new members of the, uh, of the committee, it would just so that you're aware, the review of special educational needs report at pages 41 to 64 of your pack. Uh, the SEN uh, MOR dated the 30th of April, at pages um, uh, 65 to 73, and the SEN MOR dated the 21st of October, uh, pages 74 to 78, and the North Iron Audit Office report closing the gap, uh, social deprivation, educational needs, um, uh, pages 79 to 103, um, and witness biographies 100. And Four to 107. So you've heard you've heard the presentations from the permanent secretary and the chief executive. Before I bring Mr. Muir in, who's the first member to uh, indicate he wants to ask, can I just can I just ask you both, in terms of our report impact review of special educational needs, could you tell us do you think that report helped in how you shaped um, the the review and the, the the recommendations that were made, how they have actually um, improved uh, the lot of the young people with, and their families with special educational needs on the ground? Chair, sure, maybe I'll, I'll make a few comments uh, on that. I think the report has been extremely helpful, um, in, in, in particular in identifying um, key areas where additional information is required that can help us to identify both the extent of need and, and where there are gaps in that information. Uh, also in identifying how we know that we're actually meeting some of the um, requirements that are set out in the legislation and the expectations uh, in the policy and in providing a focus, I suppose, for the department and the EA to work together to um, take forward that work. I think a report from the PAC is always taken very seriously by the department and I know by the education authority and also by <coughs> ministers obviously and that does provide significant uh, um, support for us in allocating resources both human and financial to, to, to dealing with the issue so I think the framework that is there is has been important it's also a very significant amount of work it's a comprehensive uh, uh, 
uh, range of work that has been requested by the EA. It will take some time, oh, sorry, by the PAC. It will take some time for all of that information to be gathered through the various reviews, to be systematized and to be delivered, but it will give us a very strong basis uh, going forward. And in the interim, I should say, we're not waiting for all of that. Uh, there is work that we are doing at the moment to try and ensure that we are enhancing uh, the existing services and taking forward and progressing um, services uh, where we can, consistent with what the PAC has asked for and consistent with the policy direction and indeed the legislative direction. Sarah, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yes, Chair, I would agree with the Permanent Secretary. I think it has been um, incredibly helpful in shaping the agenda. And as the Permanent Secretary has said, some of this work will be ongoing now for a number of years, so it will continue to be. So, if, for example, if we look at the independent review of, of SEN services and some of the research that has been commissioned as part of that, that will um, have, have a longer term ongoing impact on how we shape, change and redesign our services. Um, and I would also agree that the, the focus on the information requirements um, to help us drive our improvement, to monitor our performance and to be able to account for that more effectively have also been incredibly helpful in terms of shaping the, the, uh, the uh, SEND development programme itself. And many of the strands of work are directly connected to some of the recommendations from that report. As you will be aware, two independent reviews were recommended by the committee. Have these reviews commenced? Well, the first one, uh, Chair, uh, is the uh, review, the landscape review, as it's called, of the of the Education Authority, and that and that has commenced and is actually a, a, in its second stage. Um, it is due to report by the end of April, uh, and as part of that, there have been uh, there's been widespread engagement with stakeholders, both uh, in the department in the Education Authority and out in the in the schools in the in the school sector. Um, so, so that is uh, on on track. Um, in respect of the second review, which is the, the broader review of SEN uh, provision and processes, uh, that has taken a little longer to put in place. Uh, we are we are at the stage now uh, where we have received tenders; they have been evaluated, and we are ready to award. Uh, the reason it took uh, a while was that initially um, we didn't attract a, a viable viable uh, uh, proposals uh, and there's also been uh, a process that has to be gone through of tender so, evaluation. What do you mean didn't attract viable proposals? Well any time you uh, put out a, a <coughs> specification you're reliant on the market responding uh, so we didn't uh, uh, receive very many proposals on those that were there uh, we didn't feel uh, were uh, sufficient to meet the, the requirements. So, so over a year since we produced this report that work hasn't commenced? That, we expect to actually uh, award that uh, contract shortly. Um, yeah, but why, I find it. I mean, this, this committee. I, I'm disappointed with this. I have to say, there hasn't been a more important report that this committee has done in its more than two-year work. And for the department and the EA and whoever is responsible within both, not to have commenced work over a year after this report came out. Uh, in terms of an independent inquiry, is I think absolutely scandalous. Um, I'll come back to that. But in terms of the, 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 the first recommendation, the first report, uh, who's carrying that out? Uh, that's, that contract was awarded to uh, Baker Tilly Mooney Moore. Mm -hmm. When was that uh, contract awarded? The contract was awarded, I think it was a October. October. I think it was October, yeah. So it was what, eight months after the report. Hmm. Neither of those are particularly complimentary, I have to say, in terms of response. Mr. Muir. Mr. Muir. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you everyone for, for joining us here today. Um, just a couple of questions. I have one question, which probably we need to take it when we go into a uh, private session, and it's just in relation to um, the ongoing HR issue, and just for an update in relation to that. So, would you be happy, Chair, if we took that in private session, or do you feel we could do that in public? Yeah, we're, we'll stick to this, if you don't mind. That, that's no problem at all. The, the other issue is just in relation to appeals, because I know that uh, 
was a very significant issue and just want to understand what the current uh, lay of the land is in relation to that and how much uh, sitting here now has the pandemic and lack of budget certainty going to affect future work in terms of addressing this. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Viewer. I am going to ask Una Turbot, who is joining us remotely, to provide an update on the um, extensive um, analysis that has been undertaken um, regarding appeals, and as a result of that analysis, um, some of the actions that are now planned in terms of taking it forward. We felt very strongly that it was important that we understood the reasons um, and did a very detailed piece of work in in coming to um, our conclusions, so I will ask Una to provide some of the detail on that. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we, we, I suppose at the time we were all very conscious that the number of appeals um, that were being taken um, was concerning and it was, our, it was impacting on public confidence in that and raised questions about the decision making processes that um, that were being were being had in relation to decisions whether as to whether or not a child would be um, moved forward for a statutory assessment and, and review. And certainly since 2015 the number of appeals um, to the to the report in 2021 had almost had almost tripled. So it was decided that um, a forensic review of of the appeals um, would be undertaken and it was undertaken by an, a, a team within the AA but independent of the Children and Young People's um, Services um, and it, it basically has provided us with very useful information I suppose um, what it has highlighted is this is not just a straightforward of a sort of board matter of a queer decision being made there's a lot of complex factors um, that are taken in, that are that are impacting on this for example the access to quality um, Stage three into report. So what we are finding is the number of requests for statutory assessments are being are being um, are related to the fact that we don't have um, early intervention services at the sufficient level, um, and that those that because families didn't have or children didn't have those services available to available to them, their families then asked for a, st a, a statement to be referred forward to the statement process. Um, there was also, we found some inconsistencies in relation to our procedures and our guidance and our professional development. Um, and, and that is something that we obviously we will need to address. Um, we, we know that we need to move to, to use our DAR service, that's the Disputes Avoidance Resolution Service, um, much more effectively in order to get earlier resolution um, to, to some of our, our situations. And we think that that, that, can, that can help moving forward. Um, we need to get additional information to parents about the, the statement process and in particular making sure that we have all of the information available to us to allow us to make the right decision at that time. What we find is that something like 50% of, of the concessions are not actually, I suppose it's the terminology, it's the, the concession, the con we're conceding because additional information is subsequently provided to us when asked for. By the um, by, the statement from team, and whenever that information is available to us, then the criteria for the the decision to proceed is actually met. So that's a big factor, and we're going to have to work better with with um, with families in relation to that. Um, we're also very keen to work with um, with the tribunal service itself, um, because it's, it it has become apparent that. Um, that the way that the the guidance and legislation is being interpreted, there's some there's some misalignment, and I think it's important that we sit down with with the tribunal service and and with ourselves and with uh, with our, our legal team just to make sure that that we have a common understanding in relation to um, to this whole area. Um, we're also very keen to to work with the community and voluntary sector in relation to supporting us. Um, with this work moving forward, and that is again about the um, engagement with with families. The report is in a final draft format. It has been shared with the SEND Strategic Development Program Reference Group, that includes the the organisations that that our chief executive has has outlined earlier. Um, we presented the information to them. They have given us some very constructive um, verbal feedback, but they're going to give us written feedback within the next two weeks, and we will finalise that report for submission. Um, and we will then for take forward the recommendations um, emanating from that work. Okay, Thank you. Mr. Mr. Muir, yes. are you content? 
Yes, thank you. And just, just in relation to the, the, the budget situation and COVID, uh, how much is that going to impede the, the future programme of work in terms of addressing the recommendations from the PAC and the lack of budget certainty and then the historical impact of, of COVID? Um, I think there's no doubt that, the, as the Permanent Secretary made reference to, that the, um, the budget position um, may have an impact on uh, the pace, potentially, of this work, but the work itself will remain an absolute priority for both the Department and for the Education Authority. And so we are working our way through how we may stage or phase it or what impact that might be, but we, what we will not be doing is ceasing our work and um, it, it, it needs to keep going and it will. Yeah, I think just to echo uh, Sarah's point there, the fact that we don't have a, a clear budget to work to uh, has introduced a, a huge element of uncertainty in all our planning. Now clearly the whole area of special educational needs is a priority for us but we have other priorities too and in, in having to take forward um, our services in the absence of a clear budget that, that does lead to difficult decisions. Um, but certainly in respect of, the, of the, uh, the, the suite of programmes, that is a priority. We're looking, as Sarah said, at whether we can do it all at once if the budget is available, and that's not clear, or whether we will have to phase it. Um, but certainly we, we will be making it a priority to maintain services and also to take forward the review. What I can say is the review to which the Chair referred, um, uh, which is the second review, uh, which we're looking at, at, at the uh, SEN review and provision. We will ensure that that is taken forward because that provides the vital uh, information base that any future actions will uh, be taken on. And I think that's a very, I think that's a very valid point, and that's why uh, I think I probably speak for the entire committee. That there is a disappointment that 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 work hasn't commenced yet because it is so vital. Well, absolutely, Chair. But I, I think uh, there's a whole process uh, for these reviews that has to be gone through, and I, I know. The, the committee will not be interested in the internal workings, but there, no, are, we're not. there, are, there are business case reviews, there are un approvals, that they're securing the funding, they're securing DOF approval, and then there's working with CPD to get through the procurement process, and then obviously there's time out for people to respond to any specification that's, that's put out. Then all, any tenders received have to be evaluated. <coughs> so there is a natural time period for any of these reviews to be done, but obviously we would have liked to have done it quicker. Yeah. Meanwhile, the young people in our schools, the teachers who work with them, classroom assistants work with them, the other people in their classrooms with them, and their parents uh, are under those continuing pressures. Mr Muir, are you concluded in your questioning? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Beggs? I have to say I'm, I'm very disappointed at the uh, slowness in, in addressing some of the recommendations that we made, and indeed flowing from the our office report, which actually was uh, 2017, our report over, over a year ago. Um, recently, we had the head of the civil service here uh, in front of the committee, and she was indicating how she felt it was important that the civil service would uh, prioritise those areas, those areas where we can make a difference. That's not what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying here, and I'll illustrate that. Um, our second recommendation was around uh, reviewing how we actually uh, 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 provide SEN support, uh, asking for benchmarking. I take it if the, if the paper exercise is done, that bit's done, but asking in particular to consider the funding uh, of SEN services, including the delegation of budgets. Now, when we had our inquiry into special educational needs, I, I highlight it to a wide range of witnesses that there can be three classroom assistants standing at the back of post-primary schools doing nothing, primary school classrooms doing nothing. That's the way SEN funding is being utilised. The children are not benefiting. Since then, during the course of our uh, TSN report, evidence was given that it can be four and five classroom assistants standing at the back of the classroom doing nothing. So my question is, why are we not doing what some schools have been able to benefit from, the delegation of that budget uh, at the boys' model. We've discovered a very successful use of that money, one-to-one -one teaching, small group work teaching, some classroom assistance, flexibility to those schools to get better outcomes and clearly getting better outcomes. Some other schools are also benefiting from that flexibility. I've discovered the same thing has happened in Abbey Community College. I understand the same thing's happening in Hazelwood. 
Why can that move forward, not move forward without any funding? Well, I'll, I'll make a few comments, and I think Sarah might want to refer to some, some work that's ongoing. Uh, there is flexibility for many schools, as you describe, and the fact that those schools are, are actually uh, uh, utilising that flexibility demonstrates that that is the case. In the early stages of, of the SEN Code of Practice, it's really down to school to decide what support and how they provide the support to the children and young people and the sort of actions that you describe and the approaches you, you describe are open to schools. Uh, of course, there is a provision that's made through statements uh, that, that specify the sort of support that is required in some classrooms and in some cases the sort of issues that you have identified can present. But I think it's important to get a balanced picture. Uh, there are many cases where we have highly skilled classroom assistants who work very effectively with the teachers in the classroom uh, to provide the support that children need. I was out in Brookfield uh, Special School on Monday with the principal there, Hil Hilary Milligan, and she was full of praise for the work that the classroom assistants provide, how skilled they are and how critical <coughs> they are to the effective operation of the school. So I think it's important to get a full picture. Of course, there are issues that need to be ad addressed, and we accept that. Um, and, and it's part of the, the whole review to look at that. But I think we need to get a balanced picture. You know, there are, there are, there are situations and circumstances where it's entirely appropriate to have a classroom assistant uh, uh, providing that support. There are other circumstances where perhaps the resources could be utilised in a different way. I don't know, Sarah, if you'd like to add just a little bit of that. Yeah, I think um, flowing out from the PAC uh, recommendation and, and the comments that were made, um, one of the things that we have tried to put in place is a, a, a system, if you like, to evaluate the effectiveness then of using alternative models. So that will provide us with an evidence base for moving forward. So as part of the overall SEND strategic programme, there is a, a work stream called the Supporting the Learner Journey. And that is exactly about looking at alternative um, models, uh, not using classroom assistance, some of the models that you have described, and tr actually tracking then the pupils um, through those journeys and uh, absolutely providing us with the evidence base then around the effectiveness of the interventions and the, the different effectiveness of the different interventions and, and what might be the best model moving forward. Information that's been provided to me is there are exceptionally good outcomes from both those schools where that flexibility has been granted. And just to be clear, I am not questioning the ability of classroom assistance. I am questioning what the Education Authority uh, and the system is having them do. I, I know personally of a very, very skilled, effective classroom assistant who resigned rather than stand at the back of the classroom and do nothing. Classroom assistants are frustrated and young people are missing out on the opportunities to benefit from learning by better methods. Well, do you I, accept I, that? Well, absolutely. Uh, I accept that, Mr Beggs. Um, there are certainly areas where more effective use can be made of classroom assistance, and there are equally areas where very effective use is currently being made of classroom assistance. And the point of the review is to get a better sense of the evidence around that, to highlight the, the different approaches that there are there, and to encourage those to be taken forward. But I think there's also another uh, aspect that needs to be addressed, and that is the wider perception of what uh, having a statement or having uh, a specific support for a child involves, <clears throat> both uh, among wider stakeholders uh, and among parents. There can be an expectation that the only support that is valuable is having a classroom assessment. That is almost like the gold standard, and that's what people push for. So there is a very important piece of work that needs to be taken forward to try and change perceptions uh, around the, uh, uh, the best form of support. What we want is the best outcome for the child and for support to be provided in a way that produces that best outcome and in doing that to allow principals, classroom assistants and the other experts to be able to establish what is best for the child and to agree that with parents. But there is a big piece of work to be done in changing the current perceptions in order to allow that to come in uh, and that, I think it is going to have to be a part of any implementation. Do you accept that giving that flexibility to the principals? to utilise their budget might even allow some, uh, some degree of earlier intervention for the benefit of everyone and uh, to, to catch up what's already happening in other places. And finally, do you understand my frustration? One year after highlighting this issue, I do not hear that issue move forward one bit whatsoever. Sorry to say. I, I, I don't just recognise your, your, your... I'm not in here, Chair. Sorry? Sorry. Sorry.
Yes, yeah, just, just, Mr. Mr. Dr. Brian was just making a point. I'll, I'll bring you in whenever he finishes. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to say that not only do I hear your frustration, but I think that Sarah and I would share your frustration. You know, we, we are keen to, to, to move on to get the uh, reviews in place and, and to improve the service. All that we're trying to do is to uh, improve the service. So we are, we are, are very keen to move on and get the improved outcomes. Uh, what, what is stopping it? Well, as I say, all of these things, uh, get, getting the review, uh, I, I mentioned some of the things that had to be gone through. Uh, there's, there, there's going to be a time taken to actually, for the actual research to take place, because if we want to uh, identify the best ways forward, there has to be a sound evidence base. That is going to take time, but it will take time initially. But what it will do is it will produce better outcomes and we will get to uh, uh, the end result in, in, in quicker time. But there are... Mr. Beg, necessarily in any of these uh, types of uh, processes, there are, there are essential time lags, and you know there, there has to be time given to allow allow uh, work to be undertaken. And I appreciate everyone would like it done quicker, and we are seeking to try and expedite that as much as we can. Maybe you know, uh, bring, you want to come bring in. an interpreter at this stage, and then Mr. Beggs can come back. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you for this, and I think it is. I think uh, we share your frustration in relation to this. Um, the classroom assistance, when they're allocated, they're allocated by the statutory assessment and review um, service taken into consideration. The advices that are received by them, including from psychologists and from parents and from others who know the children. Now, when those when those classroom hours, classroom assistant hours are being allocated, consideration is given to the number of um, classroom assistants in 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 the particular classroom and based on where the where the child is going to attend. Um, and we know that there are occasions whenever. We, it is our view that there would be a lesser number of hours required, um, but we find ourselves in a situation where, where there is, is challenge and indeed sense to pay because individual children are not provided with an individual classroom who only looks after that child. And that isn't, that isn't what happens in other jurisdictions, for example, where there's teaching assistance allocated. Um, and it's a different model. Now, what we do need to do, and it is one of the key work streams in the SEND transformation program, is to review the classroom assistant, adult assistant model, um, so that it is it is more responsive to the needs of all of our children, um, and and that's a critical element of of the work as we as we proceed. I do, I do also want to say, though, that we also have worked with schools, and I personally have been have been working with with a number of principals where we have looked at the number of classroom assistants that they have, and with their consent and with the parents with the consent of parents, um, we have reprofiled how those how those classroom assistants have been allocated, and in fact, on some occasions, we have converted classroom assistant hours into. Uh, teaching hours where we felt that, that was more appropriate. So we're very keen to be flexible. We are working with schools um, to make a difference, but in order to, to deliver in the way that we need to do in a systemic, longer term manner, we need to take the same transformation work um, forward. And that will inform the policy moving, moving forward. Just a final question. If there are principals who, who might be following some of our comments in this, what do they have to do to get flexibility like some schools already have? Because I know there seems to be unanimous agreement that this should move forward. So what has to be done even to get temporary delegation of this and ability, the flexibility to better manage the funds that are available for the benefit of the young people? Every, every school has a, an aligned um, officer from the statutory assessment and review service. Um, so those discussions are had at that at that level at that point in time. But I suppose the important thing that, that the schools need to do is engage with parents because whether we like it or not, parents want individual classroom assistance for their child because it gives them that sense of security and confidence because our stage three system, our, our stage three services aren't at the level that they need to be. Um, and, and that will that continues to be a challenge for us. And, and do the parents understand the role of most classroom assistants at post-primary school to stand at the back of the classroom? Well, I, I think parents are very involved in the in the statementing process, and they understand what is you know undertaken through that statement. And yes, we have situations where um, we have parents who have insisted in having one-to-one um, -one classroom assistance for their child, for example, because they are concerned about 
um, their child's dyslexia needs or literacy needs or their or other needs and, and it, they, they insist on it and, 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 and if it's written on a statement it's a statutory statement and we have to provide it. I think uh, Mr Beck, just, just, just to add to what Una said, that, that building of confidence and understanding and awareness among parents is going to be absolutely critical because they, they are a, a key part of the whole process and the, our, our ability to uh, point to the evidence which demonstrates that different approaches rather than having individual classroom assistants appointed to, to, to support each child. The, the evidence that we can gather there and the testimony that we will be able to get from parents uh, where that has proved successful for their children we will be part of all the process we need to put in place to build that confidence to pave the way. Simply making a change uh, uh, in policy uh, will only run into a lot of opposition from parents at present. We need to have a wider approach, I think, which takes parents with us, other stakeholders with us, and builds on the, on the, uh, the knowledge and the research and the evidence base that we have. The educational outcomes shown uh, to me at Boys Model, and also when I was at a visit to Abbey Community College, demonstrated exceptional, exceptionally good outcomes for all children, including those with uh, special educational needs, because of the flexibility that's been shown and the ability of those principles to give appropriate learning mechanisms for, for all their children. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mr Hillage. Thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome this afternoon, folks, coming back to us with the update. Just a couple of areas which I had covered previously was uh, with yourself, Sarah. I'd asked you about learning from other places within the devolved situations in the UK, and you'd indicated that there was some of that going on. Has that continued, and it has it been beneficial, or could you give us some idea of that? Okay, it hasn't continued at the rate at which we would like it to have continued, Mr Hilditch, and really that's because of the circumstances we find ourselves in connected to COVID. So at that time, we had made contact with the local government association um, in terms of peer review and joining them on their peer review programme. We haven't been able to proceed with that simply because of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Although certainly in designing the SEND programme, and um, we have looked, so we've we, we've done our, our, our desktop, if you like, on some of that, and looked to the alternative models and what they might look like. So that has it has informed us moving forward. It hasn't it hasn't resulted in the impact and the shared learning across that peer review programme that we had originally intended. But it's certainly something we now intend to pick back up. Back up things Absolutely. Improve, then. Oh, welcome, welcome that. Uh, just on yesterday's situation in regard to the integrated education bill and any potential knock-on effect it has on budgets or anything like that, did you see that as a, as a threat, a challenge to have to now maybe, I don't want to say detrimental to SEM, but certainly spread the budgets a bit further may have to happen? Well, maybe I'll try and make an answer to that, but I, mean, I think it's actually very difficult to tell at present, I and mean, part of what we will be doing in the department right now is just working through what the implications are of the Integrated Education Bill and what precisely some of the clauses and so forth that are contained in there will actually mean. And uh, that may take some time. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have our own legal advice on what some of the clauses mean. Uh, some of these may be tested uh, at time, but we, we will be looking at what the, the implications are for policy. But I think it's too early to say what the impact might be, but I wouldn't expect it to have an a, a impact on this particular uh, area. I Hector. hope it wouldn't have an impact in this particular area. Well, hopefully not. Thank you. And obviously you'll keep looking at that situation. The committee was uh, concerned at one point about the, an independent review being carried out and who was carrying that out. Uh, did we have anybody directly from the EA involved in that independent review? For instance, was the uh, interim director of the Children and Young People Services involved in that review? Are, Which you, would be are, you, are, are, are you referring to the review of the EA or the wider review of the special educational needs services? The, probably the, the one that the committee. There was two. Had, there was two. It was two. two you're yeah. right, but there was one the committee was particularly concerned with as to who was actually carrying that out. I can't remember. Well, the, the independent it. review of the of the EA is, is being carried out by a, a consultancy or, or, or organisation. It is independent, and it will report to the uh, department. Um, so, so it, it's in, totally in, independent. But yeah. what it will be doing, obviously, as as any review would do, uh, is taking the views of those that are in the education authority, those that are in the department, wider stakeholders, uh, the recipients of services, and so forth, in 
in gathering the evidence base for any conclusions or any recommendations uh, that, that it makes. Mm -hmm. And the, the other review then that you referred to? The other review is the one that we're about to appoint, um, which is about the uh, review of the SEN service provision and uh, processes. And again, it will be an external uh, body that will be taking that forward. But the same process will apply. They will be talking to stakeholders, talking to people in the education authority involved yes, in delivering yes. the service. I think the question the was that you know, there's nobody at the top end of that actually carrying out the review as such from in no, it's from a, internally it's, within it's EA. It's an independent external body that will be carrying out the review and uh, will be reporting into the uh, department. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, is there still ongoing issues on, on HR matters in relation to suspensions, retirements, long-term illnesses? Is there pressure coming from that end of things, HR, affecting the rollout of some of your work? In the education authority. Yes, uh -huh, yes. Let Sarah answer that. No, it's not. It's not. not, it's not there is no HR issues that are impacting on the work and, and on driving the work forward, um, and we continue to do that within the education authority. So no, we are content that the work is driving forward. As we've said, our, our probably biggest concern is our budget uncertainty as we move into next year. But at this point in time, this remains the EA's top priority, and it is being uh, prioritised in that way. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms Flynn. Um, thank you, panel, um, for your comments so far. I just wanted to maybe come back to one of the points that David raised there around um, the, at the previous evidence session, we had that discussion around comparisons and learning from other jurisdictions um, in relation to some of these issues. and. I know you had mentioned there, sir, that some of that work wasn't able to be carried out um, due to the pandemic. And I'm just wondering, is that down to a, a staffing issue, you know, with staff having to be sort of redeployed to deal with the, the COVID? Or have you a wee bit more detail on why that work with other jurisdictions maybe couldn't have went ahead, even via Zoom or whatever? OK, so the, the, the specific programme that we had um intended to become involved in was a, was a peer review programme and so that effectively meant that um, education authority staff would be trained as peer reviewers and that they would go and review other jurisdictions, uh, local district councils in England but equally then those local district councils would come um, and, and review the education authority and share best practice etc. So that was an, a very active peer review process rather than, if you like, an academic or a desktop exercise. So it really was down to those constraints. We, as I say, obviously, in terms of desktop um, learning, um, it has formed you know, a clear part of, of the development of the um, strategic outline case um, that we have developed. But that was a much more active participation, ongoing, continual programme of peer review and learning. Um, that uh, we just we weren't we weren't physically able then to, to progress. No, no, that's that's fair enough, and I, I understand that then. If um, obviously staff had to go through that process of training, and that was like a specialised piece of work that they were going to carry out. But maybe just to follow on from that as well, then. So has any work been done? Because I know at the again one of the last witness sessions we were asking um, the question around why our rates of um, SEN are much higher, um, you know, in terms of, you know, comparison, comparing with other other jurisdictions. And I know that some of the feedback was around, you know, like the last time around, we couldn't get any clarity from the department or the EA as to some of the reasons behind that. Um, so I'm just wondering, has any sort of research or work um, been undertaken to try and get to the bottom of that? Um, that might be part of the, the you know, the reviews that you are carrying out. But has any work been done around that to, to provide some clarity to the committee as to why our rates are much higher? Well, that actually is is a key part of uh, the uh, the second review, uh, or the, the the review that's in recommendation number two is is to look at the the, the differential rates and look at the potential factors uh, behind that, and, and we anticipate that. Uh, that will be uh, uh, undertaken by uh, academics uh, who will have experience uh, and knowledge in that area because it, it isn't clear precisely the extent to which this arises from 
uh, uh, particular environmental factors here, whether it's legacy of the troubles, uh, intergenerational trauma, whether it's linked to poverty, whether there are any other factors like that, or whether it's due to difference in, differences in approaches, or whether, as is most likely, it's probably a combination of both. But that's what that uh, second review is intended uh, to look at. Okay, that, that, that's fair enough. Um, thanks for, for those responses. And then maybe just to move on to the issue around the educational psychology service. So um, again, I know we we'll have previous conversations around um, this whole issue of unmet need, and you know um, that, that obviously all the pupils that were requiring that sort of support service that weren't necessarily receiving it. So I'm just wondering, even outside of the reviews that haven't haven't commenced yet, um, has any work been undertaken to try and identify that unmet need um, in terms of the number of children that are seeking that specialised access to SEN support services? Um, because I know that schools haven't been able to refer all the pupils who might need that support to the educational psychology service. Um, and do you have any idea around the numbers of children um, that we're talking about that are actually waiting to be referred to the educational psychology service? So that work is underway. Um, you're absolutely right. Our priority, as we said um, at the outset, was the statutory operations process. Um, and we would then move forward into our pupil support services. So while the full review of educational psychology services has not yet commenced, um, that work is underway uh, in terms of identifying the unmet need um, for the educational psychology service, because again, that piece of work itself will form uh, you know, a key part of understanding what the review of educational psychology services needs to achieve as well. So, I mean, they're, they're very connected and very linked. So while we haven't undertaken the review, we have commenced the piece of work to identify the unmet need um, out at, at school level. Um, and we are doing that uh, through the educational psychology service and um, using a, a representative sample of schools to be able to indicate to us what that might um, tell us. And Una, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think it's fair to say that the psychology services under the education psychologists um, are under particular pressure in relation to the demand. The more the demand, we've had an increased demand and we haven't had an increased number of, of education psychologists. And there's good reason for that. I suppose there's a funding issue, but over and above that, even if we had the funding, the educational psychologists aren't there, there to recruit. So what we've also done is we have created an additional role called an assistant psychologist. Um, and those are those are um, postgraduate um, in, um, officers who have um, a psychology degree and they also have two years experience in working with children and they are being recruited to work alongside the educational psychologist um, service to increase that um, that um, capacity and um, the demand is increasing um, we, we, um, it, it's challenging um, for example you know in, in 2015 for example we had um, 140 whole time equivalent education psychologists and in 2021 we have 101 educational psychologists now the health and psychology assistants um, have been recruited but it's limited their, their, their role is very useful but it is limited in terms of actually providing um, professional assessment so that has been a particular issue for us um, we have put forward a business case for an additional uh, additional student psychologist, and we want to see the number of student psychologists um, increase to 14 per year of over the next um, certainly two years and, and possibly three years um, in order to get the capacity of the educational um, psychology services um, back up again. But I think, as, as Sarah indicates, the research that we're about to embark on is being led by the educational psychologist service itself. These are these are doctors. They are doctorates in in, 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 a, in, in an academic sense, um, so they're well placed to carry out this research. And it, the research will involve twenty percent of of our schools, which will give us a good baseline information in relation to where the gap is and where the need is, particularly in stages one to three, because that's where we have a dearth of information. We know we know the number of children who are referred to a set for statutory assessments, and those children are prioritised. Um, by the education psychologist because it's a statutory obligation. But my biggest concern and our biggest concern is building up our, our earlier intervention services because that's where we're going to get um, more timely responses for children. Um, that's 
going to result in, in, in more efficiency and, and, and value for money. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Rosa, it's really worrying that we're down to, if we're down to 101 um, educational psychologists, and as you say, then the demand with the, the young people and the children is rising. Do you know, like that's a massive de uh, deficit that, that's only going to get worse. Um, so hopefully, hopefully things can be improved there. And see, just to follow on, see in terms of then the targets, because I know that was another thing that came up the last time around that um, the pupils that were ex support services, I think it was for stage three. Um, that they were getting the, the assessment by the Educational Psychology Service, but that there was no targets on how quickly a child with SEN could access those support services. So has there been any work done or any changes to simplify that process and uh, to set targets? Can any of that be, can any of that be done in, in the interim? It's underway. It's not completed yet, but it is underway. So again, we, we very much started with our statutory operations service. Um, but that work that we've done and those metrics that we have developed for our statutory operations service and all of that um, data analytics around how long children are waiting, uh, what the, all of that, um, we are now in, uh, underway in terms of our our stage three services so that was absolutely our next focus and our next priority so we, we haven't concluded that work yet but it is underway perhaps if i could just add a, a little bit to the broad thrust of your, of your of your question in terms of the educational psychology service uh, we would have plans to try and and increase the recruitment there uh, that will again be dependent on future budget uh, and we're not clear about that at this point in time. The other element that will help in terms of the question that you asked about unmet need, I think at the moment a lot of this information is held in schools uh, and uh, may be held in a, a variety of different forms. So the, uh, the, the development of the personal learning plan, uh, which is part of the, the overall uh, new code of practice, um, will provide a standardised basis that will set out um, the needs for the various children in, in schools. It will be um, held electronically um, and it, not only will it reduce bureaucracy but it will give us the opportunity then to run reports where we can get and collect that information on a consistent basis electronically from, from the schools. So that, that will help us to assess the unmet need but as Una was pointing out we then have to be able to address the unmet need which requires the additional investment of resources uh, for that to be able to happen. Mm -hmm. okay, well, look, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr Boylan. Mr Boylan, can you hear me? <coughs> oh, it seems to drop out. Can I, can I just ask um, when he tries to re reconnect there? <clears throat> In terms of the... the Regulations in the Code of Practice, have they been finalised yet? Um, the, the, the regulations uh, haven't been finalised yet. Uh, as, as, as you'll be aware, we had um, a, uh, a consultation some time back. Um, and with the passage of time and with the uh, fur further developments, we, we repeated that consultation, which is actually quite an unusual, an unusual thing to do. Uh, and as part of that, in terms of the <coughs> response to that, um, there threw up a number of issues um, which are being uh, on, on which we have got legal advice and which we are working uh, our way through. Um, so our intention uh, is that we will bring these forward in a phased basis uh, in terms of implementation, and that will happen uh, early in the next mandate. So. We have two independent reviews, one not started, one that started in October not completed, and there's been no start to the new regulations in Code of Practice? Well, the, the new regulations in Code of Practice obviously uh, uh, stem from the 2016 Act, since when we've had three years without an Assembly and two years of COVID. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, we have been working on the regulations, there has been work taken forward, there was the, the, the second consultation, the analysis of the responses to that, DSO advice, and we have been uh, back and forward with DSO clarifying that advice, and, and uh, we are w working through the final stages of those regulations, and we would hope that we can introduce them early in the, in the so, next the three month. years of suspension and then COVID are the reason why we haven't had 
the new regulations in the code of practice? Well, they have had a significant impact because uh, uh, without without ministers, we can't decide on the uh, on the way forward in these areas. Would you have had ministers for two years? Yes, uh, but we didn't have an executive. We didn't have a mechanism for taking these forward. So they, this is all. What you did for impact. two years. This has all had an impact on the on the uh, the the work. Um, however, um, we have been taking forward work in the interim. Um, uh, in, in what's called in contemplation of legislative effect and the, 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 the personal learning plans that I described are one example where work has been taken forward in those. There has been a discussion with stakeholders uh, and we're, uh, we, have, we have developed uh, the electronic approach uh, around that and we're hoping to be able to uh, roll that out next year, uh, all in, in uh, contemplation of the, of the regulations uh, actually going through. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any other member who's asked to be brought in for questioning. Can, can I just make you aware, uh, you, you may know that the head of the civil service was in front of the committee on Tuesday, um, and we did uh, push for the resource to be made available in terms of the first start closing the gap recommendations um, to, to help address many of the issues. Um, just before uh, I conclude the, the session, um, can I, sorry? Oh, Mr. McHugh, sorry, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, just as in relation to uh, grounds that have already been covered by uh, Ms. Flynn, uh, <clears throat> and in terms of uh, the um, educational psychologist and so on, and given the limitations of service there and uh, the backlog that one has, um, is there any sort of effort at all made on the part of the department, even in dealing with schools, to allow where uh, some parents have actually gone out themselves and paid for their own uh, assessment of their children to find then that the schools are reluctant to accept those same assessments? I think I'll maybe ask Una to comment on that. Um, I think what I would say is it, is it is part of the work that we have been undertaking as part of the, the tribunals, because um, quite often the additional information that then is provided um, that the EA then has to concede its tribunal on is an independent psychology um, assessment. So we do know that it is an issue, um, and we are hopeful that when we undertake our review of educational psychology services um, and are able to move forward to develop that service, that we will be negating the need for that to happen. Um, but as it stands at the moment, um, the tribunal will take into consideration an independent psychology assessment. I'm glad to hear that because it's an issue that is continuously raised with me. Uh, and as I say, not that I'm suggesting for one second that we should have a two-tier system that whereby people that can afford it uh, can actually uh, access the service, but that uh, it would be welcome if that's taken on board as well. Graham Margaret. Okay, thank you. Um, and so just before we conclude this session, Mr Donnelly or Mr Stevenson, have you any qu questions or queries you want to ask? Uh, no, Chair, thank you. Okay, Mr Stevenson. Okay, can you hear me, thank Stuart? You. you okay? Chair, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, nothing to add from a DOF okay. perspective, Chair. Thank you. Okay, well, look, thank you both very much, and to your colleagues who joined us remotely for your time this afternoon. I think it's fair to say, uh, and I, on behalf of the committee, um, we are disappointed and unimpressed at the fact that one of the reviews that hasn't been commenced and the other hasn't been completed. Um, and uh, we will uh, have a discussion around session now in close. So thank you both very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat>
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Broadcasting, can you confirm that we are in public session? In a second, so we can bring the. I think we're trying to gather up the witnesses. Oh. Bad one time, very good. Mm. One time, very good. Sorry, she is, she is. Have we got any confirmation from broadcasting that we're, we are put in public session yet? Okay. Okay. Um, so, members, agenda item nine then is inquiring into planning in Northern Ireland. Um, this uh, pages one hundred and eleven to one hundred ninety-one of your pack. Uh, we're pleased this afternoon to be joined in the meeting by members of the gathering. Uh, Dean Blackwood, Mr. San Harper, Mr. George McLaughlin, I think Ms. Nula Crilly, who's joining us remotely. Uh, we also have in attendance Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, and his team, and Stuart Stevenson of oh. the TOA from the Department of Finance. In your pack uh, are the relevant papers, the Northern Ireland Audit Office Planning and Report, uh, pages 111 to 186. 
the gathering, a, a background on the organisation, 187, suggests there is, uh, in terms of the brief, 188, uh, gathering witness biographies, 189 to 191. Uh, and uh, so, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms Crilly and representatives of the gathering to the Public Accounts Committee today. Uh, Ms Crilly, would you and your representatives uh, like to make an opening statement, and then we will have some questions from members. Good afternoon to you all. Hi, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hear you, yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak and then Dean is going to um, speak on the key themes. So I just wanted to say thanks, first of all, for giving us the opportunity to speak today as part of the ev evidence giving session. Um, I think it's really important that the voices of local people are heard. Um, I work in a place called St Collins Park House, it's a peace centre and in that I coordinate a programme called Compassionate Campaigning and through that programme I get to support the gathering. Um, and I just wanted to give a wee bit of background about the gathering. It was formed in 2017 by three local community based organisations who were concerned with the ongoing environmental threats posed by Maboy illegal dump on the outskirts of Derry. And in the years since the gathering has grown hugely, we would describe ourselves as an open collective of individuals, communities, grassroots based campaign groups and activists. The gathering embodies a dynamic repository of skills, knowledge, expertise and creativity gathered from our own lived experiences in pursuit of environmental and ecological justice. And we have some 60 affiliated communities through campaign groups spanning 10 counties across Ireland and all counties of the north. Represented, representatives of these groups gather together every three months when we host speakers on a range of environmental issues and we allow time for all campaigns to give voice to the campaign issues. A number of subgroups also operate within the gathering examining broad issues that concern campaigners. And of relevance to today's meeting is the gathering council stroke planning subgroup. And this group itself came about because over the past four years, as we listened to citizens talk about their planning concerns, it became clear that distinct patterns were emerging in the lived experiences of local people, even across different council areas. And we were uniquely placed through the gatherings and through our many gatherings to record the patterns that were emerging across all of the council areas as opposed to being the failings of one rogue council. So this gathering council subgroup met in June 2021 to discuss these emerging patterns and behaviours with a view to making representation to the Northern Ireland Audit Office review of the planning system. And additionally, as we discussed the growing number of cases that were coming before the courts, we wonder what was the cost to the public purse. We've submitted freedom of information requests to council areas for legal costs pertaining to planning matters, including the costs of judicial reviews, legal advice for complaints, and any other expense related planning. Um, those uh, responses coming back so far show that substantial costs are indeed being incurred. And the other thing I just wanted to note right at the beginning is to say that the majority of people involved in the gathering do so on a voluntary and an unpaid basis. And they do so because of their shared passion and desire to protect the natural environment and all of its ecosystems. There are local communities all over the north and beyond whose daily lives are impacted by bad planning and failing environmental regulation. And some of those lives have been made a living hell. So it's also important to note at this point that nobody actually undertakes any of these activities for the crack, to be vexatious or simply to cause trouble because the cost in terms of the mental and physical well-being to many members of the gathering has been immense. And it is part of our role within the gathering to provide solid solidarity and support and solace and strength to local individuals and communities undertaking actions to protect our shared environment. So I want to thank you for allowing me time and I'm going to pass over now to Dean who will talk more in more detail about these recurring themes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I thank you again for the opportunity to present at what is a very important and emotive issue for many citizens and campaign groups that form part of the gathering's growing collective voice. In many of these community organisations, they only exist because of bad planning and a deep sense of injustice inflicted at the hands of what our collective experiences suggest is an increasingly dishonest planning system. We have two prominent campaigners here today 
who can testify as well as any the impacts of the bad, uh, what bad planning inflicts upon the public purse, our environment, and importantly, personal health and well-being of, of our citizens. So it's in everyone's interest that Northern Ireland has a fit-for-purpose regime, because frankly, we could have filled this chamber today of, with people traumatised mm -hmm. by engaging with a dysfunctional planning system. But it's also important to emphasise that there are many committed and honest public servants and planners, many of whom privately express their deep fears about the decline in the planning system to us, but worryingly also express their reluctance to raise concerns. This makes it all the more important that citizens are taken seriously when speaking up about wrongdoing and planning. In the context of the Audit Office report, I will set out our collective view on what needs to change within planning if it is to become a more fairer, balanced and transparent system for those it currently alienates. And at the heart of our concern is the squandering of the integrity and credibility of planning as a public institution and whether the report goes far enough in seeking to establish the root causes of why the planning system commands so little public trust and respect among those it is meant to serve. What follows cannot be categorised or dismissed as matters of speculation, disagreements or mere differences of professional opinion. Rather, comments I make about the planning system are firmly grounded in objectively verifiable evidence to support those concerns. Indeed, the gathering would contend that senior public officials are not ignorant of the evidence of neglect and wrongdoing that they are often presented with and continue to preside over. Our collective experience indicates to us that officials who should be engaging openly and ensuring high ethical standards are maintained within their public bodies tend to engage with citizens from a position of power and not intellectual honesty or credibility. Often this is done to evade addressing real issues of irregular and improper practices and conducts in planning, which I'd suggest remains the significant barrier to achieving cultural change that the Audit Office report recognises as fundamental. Emerging from the gathering's planning subgroup were three broad recurring themes drawing from the lived experiences and testimonies from across our members. And we categorise these themes as administration and failures of the system. Uh, professional competence, skills deficits affecting the system, and professional corruption, that is, increasingly characterising the system in the eyes of the public. While I could say a lot on the first two themes for the purpose of this presentation, I focus on the latter. Professional corruption is less to do with allegations of bribery or brown envelopes and more about the unethical practices and conducts within public service. Indicators of professional corruption are wide-ranging. Uh, and include the deliberate withholding of information, an unwillingness to clarify or explain an action or misstatement, a persisting aversion to record keeping, unauthorised removal of documents from planning files or portal, <coughs> a willingness to rationalise an obvious mistake rather than acknowledge and put things right, the use of false and misleading evidence or information, and I could go on. And as a planner who spent my entire career in public service in Northern Ireland, I say with deep concern that these are all examples of professional corruption that I directly and regularly experience when raising concerns about planning at both central and local government level. The same worrying patterns of professional corruption and are experienced and documented by other numerous campaign groups associated with the gathering. Such actions must be seen as abuses of public trust and power on befitting of public servants. And usually, professional corruption is corporately driven. There is a wide body of academic research which indicates that professional corruption, if not addressed, becomes learned, contagious, socialised and ultimately normalised into the culture of public institutions. The concern the gathering has is that this is what is being allowed to happen in the Northern Ireland planning system. This should be of concern to everyone, as not only do ethical, unethical practices and conducts corrupt the planning institutions that engage in wrongdoing, but can corrupt other public institutions, such as our judicial system, when the courts are taken in by false and misleading evidence. 
In adopting its high-level approach to review of the planning system, the Audit Office report misses a major opportunity to meaningfully address such evidence-based public concerns around professional corruption. Given that the report confirms that the Audit Office regularly receives concerns about planning decisions, it would seem appropriate to complement the high-level approach to review with a controlled case study methodology designed swiftly and to, designed to swiftly and purposively select and examine the veracity of some of the more serious concerns it has received from the public about planning. In the interest of restoring public trust in the planning system, the Committee has respectfully requested to exercise its authority to ensure purpose of case study inquiry is directed into the serious public concerns around professional corrupt, corruption in planning. To allow professional corruption to become culturally embedded will only ensure that the planning system can never regain its integrity or public legitimacy, but will remain in a state of de degeneration. And as set out in more detail in my submissions, for, for an equitable planning system, the public needs effective and independent oversight and scrutiny of the planning system, including robust mechanisms where the public can raise concerns about professional corruption with the assurance that this will be taken seriously. The public needs equal rights of planning appeal that can ensure meaningful public participation and can counter the considerable risks to the planning system identified in the audit report and that can address the United Nations findings of non-compliance set out in Section 3 of Decision VIII-8S. The public needs planning portals that are fit for purpose and compliant with Section 5 of that same United Nations decision recently issued in October 2021. And helpfully, it sets out the obligations of UK councils under international law in respect of how they make planning applications available online. Measures such as those set out um, can, that can bring accountability into the planning system will go some way to restoring the public's trust that has been previously squandered. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I was just wondering also if it would be appropriate for our, my colleagues to make some... We normally allow 10 minutes, and I, I mean, every, your colleagues will have a, an opportunity to respond to que in terms of questioning, but you, you'll appreciate with a very busy schedule, and we want to hear from you as much as is possible. Uh, and so that interaction is, is, is vital. Can I just ask, before we, we do start that questioning, um, what parts of Northern Ireland do you all come from, respectively? I'll start with you, Ms Crilly. Where, where, where do you um, reside? I'm in, I'm in Derry City, so Derry Strand District Council area. OK. Yourself? I live in East Belfast. I live in South Down, so ABC Council area. OK. I am in the Derry um, City and Strabane okay. District Council area as well. Okay, thank you very much um, <clears throat> for your for your time this afternoon. We're we're, we're very keen uh, to hear from you, um, and thank you for making that that um, initial contact. You will know this committee has heard from the Audit Office. Uh, we have heard from the Department in terms of the Permanent Secretary uh, and the Chief Planner uh, as well, and we we've heard from Nilga, uh, but we wanted to hear uh, um, from from yourselves because. Many of us have been um, involved in local government, um, although most of us, given our age, prior to RPA, uh, and, and not sort of directly involved in, in some of the issues that local uh, government now faces in terms of planning. Um, can I just ask, um, and whoever can, can sort of answering, what are your views on the standards and ethics within the planning system? Sorry, just let me. Could I just ask? There's some there's some um, interference there. Can I ask members if they could um, mute their devices if they're uh, if they're not going to be speaking? Thank you. Sorry. I'll maybe start, and if anybody wants to come in, but in theory there are um, considerably um, good standards in terms of if it's in the department, for instance, the Civil Service Code of Ethics, uh, or there's a, a similar. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but within local councils, sets out the uh, code of conduct for both councillors and the, indeed for public servants. Also, planners, uh, not all, but I imagine quite a significant amount of them are, are professional planners, so they would also be bound by the professional codes of conduct 
and their guidance on ethical standards, depending on which, whether they belong to the Irish Planning Institute or the Royal Town Planning Institute. So, in theory, um, there there is significant standards to comply with, but in practice, we would find that very often those standards are. are blatantly ignored. In fact, I think I had mentioned in my um, detailed submission that we were, with planning we are in danger of, of uh, straying into a post Nolan's principle era. Okay. Any of the others want to add to that? Well, I would be happy to add to it. Okay, that, yeah. you know, the experience of, that I have had with planners, both within ABC Council and within Department of Infrastructure as well, because we have been dealing with both bodies, um, is that very often questions go unanswered, um, reasonable questions go unanswered, and correspondence um, disappears often into a black hole. Sometimes you have to chase things. Sometimes um, you get an answer, but it's not um, to the question that you asked. Um, and so I don't think necessarily they're... I think it, they're very careful, and they don't always want to answer reasonable questions. In terms of the... Um, one of the things that has been... Oh, sorry, yes, Mr McLaughlin, yes. Sorry, just to continue with that, um, that, that particular theme of that question, um, particularly to do with um, codes of conduct, we have found that to be a very difficult area altogether, in that sometimes uh, councillors will actually make incorrect statements at planning meetings, and that is not really followed by... We have a legal person sitting there at, at the council, but that is allowed to happen and allowed to continue. And... Uh, that has resulted in one occasion in a QC having to be called in because of the fact that that was allowed to happen. And the, the code of conduct is one thing. Um, I have a short statement ready for you if, if you if I have an opportunity to just maybe read that through quickly sometime, which would fill you in on that. But the other area is where our people, uh, the council, and all of that, one of our biggest pr problems is people making promises and not keeping those promises. And, for example, in our council area, refusing to, to give information. Uh, and sometimes when you inquire about the information, you have to go through a whole complex procedure of uh, the, uh, the information commissioner and things like that, and, uh, or look, looking for information in, in different ways, having to go through a lot of, around a whole lot of corners. They make it very complex for us altogether. Now, the thing about it is they, 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 they make it difficult, but our whole aspect is that we, we, even, the, even the, the top level of people in, 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 this, in the council and even politicians have actually made us promises. They tell you to keep your head down, we'll keep you right and all that sort of thing, and we'll look after you. doesn't happen. I think that, that tactic of sort of delay, keep them happy, respond, whatever, certainly in our case... Was, has been going on for almost five years to the point where you know the turbine at Knock Ivey may become immune from enforcement action simply because um, nobody's doing anything, and, and that, that looks like it looks deliberate. You know, whenever you've been informed by a government body, as they were by the Historic Monuments Council, that the turbine permission should be revoked, it was an error. When 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 everybody's in agreement that it was an error, when everybody's in agreement that it's a special place, and they just continue to go ahead. Turning a blind eye to something like that that's so serious for almost five years is uh, it's hard to believe that that's, you know, just... It's, it's hard to accept that, that, that that's reasonable conduct. Mm. In terms of the... Um, one of the issues that, that we have heard recurring in, in the evidence session we've had so far is that the restructuring of, of local government uh, and the downsizing of 26 councils down to 11 uh, and you know the fact that a lot of um, uh, qualified and experienced staff decided to leave, that there's a um, a skill shortage. Would you would you agree with that in terms of your experiences? I don't, certainly, it, it appears that there were occasions where we had a better understanding of the EIA regulations than the people that we were dealing with in the planning department. I think that's fair to say. When um, you say was, is that now better? No, it's not no. in court. Uh, they haven't actually made it to court yet, but they're, they're, the, 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 the matters that were outstanding when the hell are still outstanding and they're in danger of timing out. And that's just one example 
of, and I mean, there, there'd be, you know, there's 60 groups in the gathering, and I'm sure that they've all got an example where exactly the same thing has happened. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think it's reasonable conduct, and I think it does raise questions about competency. Um, when, when, you know, and Nilla, did you want to come in there? I, I, so yeah. I, I, just, just, just take on a second. I'll bring you in. I, I, I appreciate you want to come in, but I just want to just um, uh, take the people in the chamber first, and I will bring you in. Um, could I, I was just going yes, to yes. Add, add to that. Absolutely, there is there's a skills shortage, and um, I think I was probably one of those people that retired at a time. And putting it in context, it wasn't that um, significant in, in that it was it was something like 40 people out of 900 or whatever. But when it when it was added up in years, that was one and a half thousand years of experience that actually left on the same yeah. day with unplanning. Um, but. There's very clearly a skills shortage, and specifically Anne had touched upon EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, and that's been something that I have been raising for quite some time, and indeed you'll note from the submissions that I've made that whilst the courts seem very, difficult, or seem, uh, very content with the way the EIA um, process operates in terms of it, it seldom finds against the public authorities, the fact is that you have the European Commission and the United Nations, both finding serious, serious failures, systemic failures, in relation to how the environmental impact assessment process has been operated. And that has been largely down to me, not solely, but I mean, I made the complaint to the European Commission because I was so fed up with not seeing the, the improvements being made, but seeing the harm that was being caused because of it. And I also made the, made the complaint to the United Nations uh, in relation to the, the management of the environmental impact assessment. And their, their, their findings that came out this year, both from the Our House Convention's Compliance Committee in July 2021, and which has now found its way into that formal decision that I referred to, um, is a damning indictment on not just our um, planning system in relation to how it... it um, a, Applies skill or its, its skills deficit in relation to EIA, but also a damning indictment on how our courts uh, operate in relation to judicial reviews on environmental issues. Okay, Mr. McLaughlin, yes. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Talking about skill shortage, uh, I very much learned about the fact that there was a skill shortage uh, as a result of the audit office report, and that certainly seems to be the case. But there are skilled people within the planning service, mm. and those skilled professionals are sometimes very frustrated because uh, the profession. Sorry, did you say frustrated or frustrating? Sorry. You say that those those professionals are frustrated or frustrating. I couldn't hear you. They're frustrated because frustrated. Okay. Uh, they, they they are making professional planning decisions. Yes. And those decisions to go to go to our councils and come before our local elected council members mm. and we have this is made clear in the report and lots of other reports that we've had that the number of overturns as we call them by local councillors against the actual professional decisions of our professional planners is really very it's, it's very questionable altogether and people are asking questions why is this happening what's the reasons for it should they not be asked to account and provide information about what informed those decisions, why they're actually disagreeing with the professional planners. That's, a, that's one big concern at, at, at the present time, and that's why, yes, that's what I'm saying, skill shortage, yes, but sometimes the skilled people are being frustrated. Okay. Um, Ms. Crilly? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. Um, the comment I was going to make just ties in as well um, with what George has said there, but also previous comments. Um, and the first one being, you know, when we were talking about codes of conduct and that kind of thing, and that's about being open and honest and ethical and having transparency. Um, there was one case that came to Derry Planning Committee in 2019, I think, was withdrawn quite suddenly um, at the behest of the department. It came back a year later and the recommendation of the planners was that it be rejected because to continue with it 
would be unlawful. And one of our local councillors still saw fit to try and approve that planning application. I can't get my head around that. When you're told it's unlawful, why would you try and approve it? So that's one thing. Um, but other things, even that planners themselves have brought up, but um, this, the, the bad quality of applications that are submitted and then accepted in this um, process of you know, putting in repeat revised submissions, sometimes at the start of a planning meeting, which then means everybody has to stop for 20 minutes to try and read something, which is not enough time for people who have to make these decisions to digest the information. You know, that's something the planners have brought up and that's something that we'd be bringing up too. But um, things not appearing on the planning portal. So you're just looking for information and it's not there, you know. Yeah, okay. You know, I, 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 I absolutely share and empathise with your frustration. Uh, there's an appalling planning decision taken in my own constituency a number of months ago when there wasn't one set of legal advices that were ignored, but a number, uh, and politicians across a range of parties uh, decided to ignore that. But that will end up undoubtedly with a judicial review. Uh, Mr Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. I think it's really important we do hear from yourselves. Uh, from your perspective in relation to this inquiry, so it's, uh, I'm really particularly grateful that you're here. My question is probably touched upon, which was just uh, uh, sort of um, mentioned at the, just in closing there, which is in relation to overturns of planning applications whereby the officer presents a recommendation, but members of the planning committee on the district council overturn that. I just wanted to say a bit more what your views are in relation to that and what concerns you have, if any, in relation to that issue. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin, uh, yes, go ahead. Well, um, this, is, uh, this, this is an issue that, that we have been raising for, for quite a long time now. And it, it just seems that a very strange situation <clears throat> that our professional planners, they come along to a meeting with very, very detailed reasons and having carried out surveys of certain areas. We've had this experience in our Prahan area, for example, uh, but it's happening throughout the north where they, they, the professional planners come along and they, you can see that they have thought this out. They have prepared, prepared very detailed submissions and that all goes in front of council and certain councillors, they decide there's, for some reason or other and we have no evidence that they have actually uh, re re referred to particular planning policies or the conditions of the area plan or whatever. We have no evidence of that. For, and questions are being asked, and it's very, it's, people are entitled to ask questions when that well, sort of thing well, happens. Let, let, let me ask you a question then, and, not, and, not, and I don't want you to name names, but no, no. Would, it be, would it be your, in terms of your experience, would it be the same councillors raising these same issues on an ongoing basis? Mostly the same councillors, but, but at, at times uh, it can be uh, you know, groupings of councillors. Okay. And there seems to be a kind of a, 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 an attitude that sometimes councillors seem to come to the council with, with a predetermined notion of what they are going to do and what, what they're going to allow or going to decide. Yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Blackwood, do you want to come in? I, I would just add to that um, certainly there, I would have concerns given the numbers and the patterns. But I think we also have to reflect on the fact that overturns is part of the democratic process. It's, but they do need to be properly documented, uh, and the public need to clearly understand them. And I do um, support the audit office position in relation to the one of the one of the potential checks that could um, be placed on, on in terms of overturns is ensuring that the public have a right to challenge them too through the equal rights of appeal process, and that would certainly lead. I suspect to better decision making because if it was thought that an overturns were likely to be challenged, I think we would have a lot more um, good planning decisions made than we, cur we currently have. Okay, um, Mr. Muir. Yes, I just want to talk about, touch upon that issue, which is I would describe as third party right of appeal. Um, I just wanted to just maybe if you could just tell us a bit more why you feel that would be crucial and how you feel that should work. Sure. Well. Currently, the, the the public. I mean, in, in our case, the you know obviously it's a, an important site. 
it was advertised, um, but the, a lot of people further away wouldn't maybe have seen those advertisements. And had had, it, had the alarm been raised Oof. earlier and people been able to actually get in and be heard in a, in a third party right of appeal, there's absolutely no doubt that, it, that it, all of this money wouldn't have been wasted. And we're talking, you know, I listened in to the talk with the DFI um, and with, the, with NILGA, um, and they were discussing things like the cost of enforcement. Um, well, you know, bad, bad decisions. Um, unlawful decisions, problems cause enforcement costs when things are done properly. And we're talking about an awful lot of money. And, and once things get to court, we've got nearly a million pounds, and ABC Council has been spent, and it hasn't even got to judicial review yet. So the cost of per planning, that's far more than it would have cost to do the right thing in the first place. Um, so it, it's mind boggling, you know. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to add on that. I would maybe just add to that on a, I suppose, a more overarching basis is that. First of all, the introduction of equal rights of appeal would help the UK and indeed Northern Ireland because the, the Aarhus Convention's Compliance Committee does look at each uh, jurisdiction within the UK separately as well. But it would help us comply with our international obligations, first of all. And that, that is very clearly set out. Um, let's see, I do have it here, actually. But the, the Audit Office of the, the United Nations um, actually finds that by failing to promote pro or promptly make accessible sorry, that's the wrong one. Bear with me a second. But in the absence of a third yeah, sorry, party right of appeal, so. you know, there was a comment about judicial review. Judicial review is expensive, but there isn't an alternative if, if, if um, the public are to try and challenge decisions which they feel are deeply unjust. And some of them are deeply unjust. So what is the alternative? Yeah. It, might, it might assist yeah. a great deal with that. <clears throat> okay. yeah, like, uh, the, the, the cost of a judicial review is inherently prohibitive to the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland, so I'm very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. I'm also very conscious of the benefits of third party right of appeal and also how that works in the Republic of Ireland. So from my perspective, it's something myself and my party supports. But on the issue of enforcement, I'm aware that that is a discretionary issue. And I think that that needs to change uh, in terms of enforcement because uh, that the, the the use of that power uh, has not been what it, what it should have been. And to me, the planning process works if both the community and the society and also the applicants are able to get satisfaction from the process. And currently, neither are. Absolutely. And uh, so that's the situation. And I think it's really important that, that what I've seen time again is when planning applications go in and they're going through determination. They, whilst the applicant has a right of appeal, the objectors, once that, that, that decision is made, the only, only way back in that is a judicial review. And frankly, that is not an option for the majority of people. So I have seen that occur in communities. And the, the example you've given in relation to Knock Ivy is a perfect example of where the planning system has failed and the cost that that has taken to both their environment and also to the public purse. So I think it's important to highlight that and highlight the issues around that, because it is an example where planning failed in relation to this. Is that you finished? Yes, it is. Thank yeah, you. Mr. Sure. McLaughlin. Hi. Uh, talking about costs <clears throat> and judicial reviews, etc. one headline in the Audit Office report was the, was the, the, the actual sort of the, the issue of financial su sustainability in the planning service. And one of the big areas of cost in the planning service is the actual area of judicial review. And, for example, a very big concern with regards to financial sustainability is the massive waste of money being paid out in fees to external legal advisors. These payments can run into many thousands of pounds and sometimes up to near a million pounds. This is all happening because of bad planning decisions being tested in court, whereas if the correct procedures were followed and the correct decisions were made in the first place, these exorbitant expenses could be avoided. So let me, let me put it to you this way, <coughs> being devil's advocate, um, before I bring in um, Mr McHugh. Is there a sufficient joined upness across local government in Northern Ireland, or is practice different? And is Nilga really or, or, um, a toothless tiger when it comes to this stuff? I don't think there is a joined upness uh, uh, across local government. In fact, what we are starting to see is um, fractious conducts or fractious um, relationships, <clears throat> um, particularly where, well, in fact, the, the Knock Ivy case is a classic one where the council has taken the, the DFI to court on it. But particularly, like for instance, another one where the um, department have failed to commence the review of old minerals permissions. 
and, and we're now council. We're now getting feedback from councils. In fact, uh, Mr. Muir's area, the Ards and North Down Borough Council, have now put a motion forward or passed the motion that the Department for Infrastructure take back responsibility for the re review of old minerals permissions because they have delayed the commencement of the regulations for so long, decades in fact, that there may now be a serious liability uh, from the environmental harm that has been caused from not uh, implementing that legislation. And there are very clear examples of that. The Craigall Quarry is the classic one where a local ecologist has documented meticulously the um, priority <coughs> Northern Ireland habitats that have been destroyed in the past 10 years because of the failure to implement the review of old minerals permissions. And what about the point about Nilga? Sorry, that one again. We well, have no real well, relationship with Nilga. That I, I <coughs> we, we did do an FOI of all councils in Northern Ireland to see if they all dealt with um, turbine applications in the same way, and we did find a variation of how different council planning departments were, were treating these applications, whether they were doing them all in one as per the EIA regs or whether they were actually breaking them up into smaller parts. So there is, <clears throat> there is variance in our experience. Mm. Uh, um, Mr Chairman, I know your question was about joined upness between yeah. councils. Yeah. Uh, I think a very big problem is the lack of joined upness and a, a real disconnect between the department and the councils. Yeah, it's beginning to get into, get into that picture is beginning so, uh, to. What I'm saying is, I have, I have actually written to the permanent secretary, etc., and to the chief planner about this, uh, this matter, and they are saying that councils are so, are there, there's, they have such an autonomy that they have no uh, kind of um, responsibility for council spending. Or council activities with regard mm. to planning. This doesn't seem right because what they're saying is they are they are, are kind of the top of the pile. You might say the actual department, but they we have no evidence of them carrying out. A, there's no scrutiny process of yeah. any sort well, happening, could, which is difficult. Yeah, well, we have picked that up, and that's why we you know we I think I, I can speak with a degree of confidence on behalf of colleagues in the committee that we will be perhaps making a recommendation will be supportive of the suggestion about a commission that, that, that looks at these things, because what's there at the moment, whether that's the communities minister and the infrastructure minister meeting or the, the, the sort of council that they have or whatever it's called at the moment, clearly isn't working. Uh, and, and apart from anything else, before you throw Nilga into the mix, there seems to be huge issues within the infrastructure department itself, whether it's roads or water or whatever around these things. Okay, um, Mr. Mr. McHugh. Hello, I'm a chair. I'm just a five year old colleague. You're not very welcome, and in particular, George, whom I know uh, and worked with a number of years back. Um, given, and I know, George, you actually alluded again to, to Prehen and the likes of it, right? And I'm aware of some of the background there. Uh, but the decisions not taken on that particular application at the time was whenever they had, let's say, the old system, i.e. it rests entirely with the planners. But the system that we have now uh, is effectively where the buck stops with the councillors, in a sense, right? Um, and yet, and all, uh, I know that, that criticism is there then, that whenever they would, we'll say, overturn particular um, uh, planning uh, recommendations by i.e. the professionals that were uh, that you referred to earlier on, that there's that criticism then of the councillors for doing that, and that sort of nearly implies that either they lack the skill, uh, the ability, or maybe even worse again uh, that there's an abuse of uh, process there. Mm -hmm. And what in fact do you think that it is, or is it all of those things? Um, well. Um, I don't want to be sort of sorry, this is vexatious or sort of vindictive in any way, but uh, the main thing is lots of questions are being asked, and some of the decisions that are being made by the local councillors are completely incomprehensible, and people feel justified in asking questions. But I, I don't want to sort of uh, I try and do things from a, from a businesslike and a dignified point of way, and I don't want to sort of point the finger too much. But just some, for some reason or other, I think the audit office proved this as well. This whole changeover from the previous planning regime to the present regime that we have now, 
I think it just, it's just the, the, our councillors were not ready for that. And we, there was a lot of sort of counsellors who were given little weekends and one, one day, a days of training and things like that, and they are not really properly trained. But the, the, apart from training, there's, there's, there's just a sort of a, a whole term of sort of honesty and, and clarity and all that that has to come into the thing that we're not getting from, from the councillors. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, that uh, I had written down here just uh, do you feel that it is a lack of training? And I know, George, you said there that you don't want to point the finger too much, but you are pointing the finger <laughs> at the end of the day. And it sounds very much like the case that where uh, you don't have that competence and consciousness in there and put to the process. And how does it we arrive at decisions at the present time? Well, um, what creates some of the questions is, for example, you know, we have one application in Prahen, and there's 14 reasons for refusal by the professional planners. And for some reason or other, not all of our councillors, but some of them actually insist, they argued for putting this, for actually putting this through, for ignoring the 14 reasons for refusal. That, that, that raises questions, you know. Mm. Yep. Well, actually, can I just make a, a, another point here that uh, very often councillors uh, at the present time, uh, and I know this from being a councillor myself, actually depend on maybe uh, suggestions or recommendations by those who were previously employed in planning. And they actually give them maybe a sound plan and reason why it is that they can object to the recommendation by, i.e., the planners. Uh, so like it is all part of the of the same system nearly in the sense uh, that where that that should that that opportunity should be there for people to contest what this has been recommended by planners and overturn it or to pass it or whatever uh, but could i ask you uh, and your group uh, just what suggestions would you make, uh, specifically in order to improve the, the whole service bring brings very, very quickly, because I, I want to bring others in, if you That's don't right. mind. Well, first of all, very quickly, uh, I, I, just what we're dealing with at the moment, actually, with sort of the, the elected members making these sort of content, sometimes controversial decisions. I think where you have where you have elected members making decisions, and where you have professional planners actually making recommendations and decisions, and and there's a disagreement or it doesn't make sense sometimes. I think there's a need for a referee or some independent person to step in and say, look, we'll settle this. Okay. I, was, I was going to suggest something along similar lines, actually, that we just need uh, a robust oversight body that monitors and looks mm. at the... So has the gathering taken a view what that robust oversight body should look like or should be? Well, we, there, there is a, an example down uh, in, in, in Ireland, uh, the Office of the Planning Regulator. Now, I don't think they operate precisely like that, but set up through set up a number of years ago, two or three years ago, the Office of the Planning Regulator monitors the performances of the councils down there, but it also has the authority to go on and look at the systemic, if there are systemic issues mm. of failures within planning. That's part of government, is it? It's, I think they're an independent body. Um, certainly, the... Set up could've... by government, though? Uh, sorry? Are they set up by government? I imagine they are, yeah. They were set up as part of... They were set up as part of, after the Mahan Tribunal, when there was serious failures and mm -hmm. corruption exposed within planning down there. OK. Um, Ms Crilly, did you want to make a contribution? <laughs> Unmuted. Can't hear you. You're, you're on mute, I think. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a couple of comments. I'd reiterate what Dean and George have just said. Um, and Andrew about equal rights of appeal is really important change to be made to allow the voice of people within the system. That may reduce the need for um, you know many judicial reviews and you know people who've taken judicial reviews in the past have often got some very bad press and they've been called names, you know, like mischief makers and that kind of thing. That's not true. It's only the recourse given to people. So um, equal rights of appeal might reduce that. Um, equally, some kind of independent office would be great. What we're finding with the gathering now is that, um, you know, they talked about an environmental protection agency back in 2008. It never happened. And we're finding more and more, not because we want to be, but because 
people are having to become experts and keep a watch and what's happening in their local council level is that people within the gathering are, are, are a form of independent environmental protection agency in a sense because we are monitoring and looking and seeing what's happening and having the challenge and it's not what people want to do but it's what people have to do so um that would be good as well um you know the quality of applications going into planning would need to change and uh, uh, and be up a wee bit which is what planners themselves have said and the other thing i just wanted to say was um in terms of equal rights of appeal when andrew was talking about giving the objectors a chance you know we don't consider ourselves objectors most of us consider ourselves protectors and you know we're trying to look after the environment and biodiversity and the only recourse is through this where we seem to be constantly challenging okay thank you Fair. Could I possibly yes, on that, that same point? Just um, what, what would make things better? From my own experience, and I know the experience of lots and lots of people, um, for me, central to what would make it better would be a transparent and respectful process. Quite often, I think, um, we're considered, you know, almost, it almost feels like gaslighting at times. It feels like you're being arm's length. It's a real hard fight to get anybody to listen to, you know, concerns that you might have. So respect is really important, and, and then just to agree with everybody else, some form of mediation, because there is absolutely nobody p piecing things together. There's nobody creating communication, and the whole thing has broken down. I, our system, I mean, I've written here, our planning system continually pits communities against companies and neighbours against neighbours, creating division and misery, and it is totally broken. So you did say earlier, I think, that uh, the gathering had written to the Permanent Secretary, yeah? Someone say that? I, I, did that. I did that. Yeah, okay. Yes. And the response was? Uh, she and the chief planner, had, uh, I had written to the chief planner and he referred to the permanent secretary. I permanent secretary referred it back to him, so we're kind of a bit of a. <laughs> hey, yeah, yes, on. minister was the answer. Her, yeah. uh, when I made inquiries about the fact that the, there was certain unhappiness about things and uh, that, uh, lack of information, and queries about council and all of that sort of thing. The, the, the main message from her was that they were, we were supposed to have what's called two, a two-tier planning system. But I can't understand that. From a business point of view, I can't understand it because she, she's saying, yes, we have a two-tier system, but we are here as the department and the councils are there of their own right. And we, uh, we, don't, really, we don't really connect with them. We don't, we don't scrutinise what they're doing, and that's, that's the answer. That, and that's very kind of annoying, because we, it left us in a situation, where do we actually go for some satisfaction? Mm. You see, this is, this is the issue with this commission we were talking about, that, that hopefully if, if they establish something with a bit of teeth, we can mm -hmm. get regularity and a, a level playing field. Chair, okay. I, I also have written to the Permanent Secretary. Uh -huh. We've written to the Permanent Secretary and the Minister okay. on numerous times. The, the response there is, is worth uh, putting on record in that I was highlighting some serious concerns about professional corruption uh, or irregularity within the planning service. The response was totally refuting it, even though there's hard evidence to, to suggest what I'm And that was from the truth. Permanent Secretary? Totally refuting it, but also threatening further action if I did not re retract it. Now, I did not retract it, and I have not seen any further action, but nonetheless, um, it's very often in planning, uh, and it's written about by a guy called Eric Weed in British Town and Country Planning, that it's attack the critic rather than address the criticism, and unfortunately, okay. that's something we face quite a lot. Okay. So, did you want... No, absolutely. I just would say that the, the effect that has on people, and this is worth stating, it's not financial perhaps, but it's certainly emotional and, you know, you have to be pretty determined and pretty thick-skinned to mm. get anywhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Mr McHugh, is that you? <coughs> no. Mr Beggs? <coughs> you have uh, collectively spoken of the lack of transparency and a particular concern uh, when... when councillors go against professional planners and uh, there's not a, really an explanation why those decisions have been made. I have seen that myself in some controversial uh, decisions as well, so I, I, I concur with your view there. But you've actually raised it to a level where you've said you're concerned about professional corruption and unethical practice, and you've listed uh, the withholding of information, removing of document filed, and even the giving of misleading evidence. I think there was a fourth issue, but I, I didn't get note of it. So my question around that, um, 
Do you have a list of documented cases that illustrate those range of things? Uh, uh, I, I don't, we haven't all died to, to, to hear it today, but maybe if there's one or two examples where you can uh, demonstrate why you can use such uh, strong language. Um, and, it's, it's, and it's language that I have used outside of this chamber as well. I've been raising it for seven years on one particular case. <coughs> um, and there is very strong documentary evidence. But the, the weird thing is nobody likes to go to look for it, despite the fact that it's sitting there in front of them. Um, but I could stand over everything. The, the, the key example, in fact, two, two examples that specifically concern me because it does not just corrupt the, the organisation uh, that's engaging in those practices, but it also corrupts the court system because of the use of false and misleading evidence in the courts. And that's a very dangerous thing because if the courts tend not to pick that up, which has happened in the two cases that I'm aware of, and in fact I'm all over them, I have very detailed analysis done of both of them, that becomes the truth essentially. And that also becomes a very um, worrying pattern that could be repeated. And in fact I will be arguing in my research that there is evidence that might suggest that with the, with the transfer of planning functions may well have went the transfer of these unethical conducts. But absolutely those two particular cases um, I could set something down in front of you now where you would see within 30 seconds the, the well, I don't have, I was going to say now I don't have it with me actually, <laughs> but I could set something down in front of you where within 30 seconds you would know what I am saying, what it's being denied. I would welcome such evidence, that's all I would say. Now, at present, uh, there's a, a local government commissioner of standards who can review uh, councillors, elected representatives' behaviour, and I dare say there's a Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman if there are concerns about administrative processes. Have you engaged in, in, in those two means of, of uh, examination where you have come across issues of concern? Um, I'm sure the Ombudsman's sick looking at me. Uh, <laughs> I have a number, I've had a number of Ombudsman's cases um, with the Ombudsman. Some I can't talk about simply because they are uh, before the 2016 Act came in, so they, they were carried out in private. Um, others that are unpublished, so I don't, I'm not sure I can talk about other than I have received apologies for them, but one, well, two cases in particular in the last two years. One against a local authority, which did find that did warn the authority that um, the lack of transparency can impact on the integrity of, of planning and environmental regulation. One against uh, not a planning authority, but it was against the department when it was a, a, a joint department where NIEA and the authority the planners were together. So the, the case is a planning case, and it's the case that went to the. Um, our House Conventions Compliance Committee. And in that case, and I've never seen this before in an Ombudsman's report, but the Ombudsman's Ombudsman found the practice of oral government. Now, that's what was, what was happening in RHA. And it also found um, breach of the Civil Service Code of Ethics and highlighted specifically honesty. So we have been uh, exhausting those processes. And in fact, I, I'll I expect I'll be putting another Ombudsman's complaint in. And in another case that I've just been dealing with in the last number of months, I've forgotten the other um, area you've mentioned, the other scrutiny body. There's the, the, there's the Local Government uh, Commissioner Standards for Councillor's Behaviour. Um, no, I've never reported a, a councillor, but I've come close. Okay. Now, one of your uh, suggestions has been uh, a third party right of appeal. Um, there is a need for balance in everything, and uh, there is widespread criticism of delays within the planning system, in particular with major planning applications. Um, are you suggesting there should be a third right of uh, appeal on every planning application, or is it just those where uh, perhaps councillors have overwritten uh, professional planning opinions, because there is a danger of the whole system being bogged down uh, even worse and no decisions being capable of being made. I'm glad you came back to that, saying as I messed up my answer the first time. Um, but certainly, the, um, in relation to the balance that's to be struck, of course, there needs to be. But I think there are already uh, indicators where those balances could be, like, for instance, we may, if, if the th even, even the deterrent of a likely third party appeal would suggest 
that um, that may encourage better decision making. So that might rule that out. Also, for instance, um, there was always the talk of that there could be vexatious appeals, and you can never rule that out, I suppose. But the deterrent there would be the Planning Appeals Commission currently can award costs against vexatious appeals. So that might also um, deter anybody from taking a, a vexatious planning appeal. But I suppose, on the, I suppose on the environmental side and the concerns that I have for the environmental side, I would probably always err on the, the importance of complying with the Aarhus Convention in relation to the Aarhus Convention only finds because I only complained about uh, cases where, where significant environmental effects would occur, but they found that the, um, the UK is in breach of the convention by not allowing, us, not allowing third parties or uh, citizens the same rights as developers. Uh, could I just nip in and just... Yeah, I, need, I, I want to try and get everybody in, so the answers could be brief, if you don't mind, because... My, my personal view would be that there, there should, that everyone should have um, a, a scope to a, a right of appeal, but it could be curtailed in other ways as well. For instance, I'm going to say everyone, I mean, if somebody has legitimately objected to it, if, if, um, then that might be a, a mechanism that, that could curtail... If some, like if you maybe shouldn't come in and, and <coughs> appeal something that you weren't involved in or didn't make representation to. In, in terms of providing comfort to developers and those who want to see the system sped up, um, it seems obvious to me that people seeking plan permission can currently not have any faith that their application is being handled properly or that it's, it's not going to be open to challenge. So there's an argument there that you know, <coughs> having a third party right of appeal would actually help give developers right. some confidence. Yeah, I, I can't let four people answer the question. That's all right. So I'm, I'm, no, just, 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 I'll wait. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to wait to, to, to yeah, Anne finish this. That's all right. Yeah, I, I, need, I need to, well, just, to keep um, the thing moving. So right, I, Anne, well done. continue on there. No, that's all I had to say on that. Thank you. Just a, br a brief follow up, if I may. The, the, uh, one of the mechanisms that's meant to be there at present is the department can uh, draw into the centre decisions which give it concern. Uh, What's your experience of that? Uh, I have seen some cases where I thought they would have and, and they haven't. So what is your experience? It's okay. almost five years still waiting. Right, okay. Can I bring the other two in? So I'm trying to be fair to everybody so we get the spread. I think um, Nula, you had been indicating to come in and I'll bring Mr McLaughlin in. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I just had a comment to make um, when the question was asked, you know, have you gone to the um, local government commissioner? Um, that's actually putting the onus back on the citizen to keep the process going, to scrutinise and oversee and then to lodge complaints. Um, there was one case I was supporting that person, and I won't say the council area, but um, it was a long drawn out thing in a planning commission. One of the councillors in the meeting was quite evasive in the answers given, um, and evasive to the point where the answer was wrong. There was a solicitor sitting there on behalf of the council who said nothing, and the rest of the planning committee actually said nothing either. So, in my reckoning, actually condoned the, the, the kind of misleading statements that the councillor said. But the person in question, the local citizen, didn't have the energy left to go and lodge a complaint with the uh, local government commissioner standard. So that's the thing. People are exhausted and tired and you're getting one thing after another and another process to go through to lodge a complaint. And also I'd like to say there's quite a few people going through the um, different um, complaints procedures of each council, you know, lodging the complaints. And some of them have one, two and three stages. And I think that complaints process probably varies from council to council. I'm not fully sure. But again, you know, those are quite exhausting. Um, procedures for individuals that constantly have to take on and some of those have resulted in councils getting an external legal cost up to thirty thousand pounds in one case you know so the onus cannot always come back on the individual have you done this have you done that there should be standards to which people are adhering um rather than leaving it all to us okay thank you before i bring mr hildage mr mclaughlin yeah, yeah. I, I was actually trying to get on at the stage where you're talking about the ombudsman uh, and uh, i i've uh, been in touch with the ombudsman the Ombudsman actually, um, not on our behalf, but on another applicant, uh, they found the Derry City Council guilty of malpractice and they suggested that the Council should have a look at their procedures and actually furnish the Ombudsman, Ombudsman with a, a plan of action where they would correct things. We never saw any evidence of that. The Council, even though the Council were fined, they continued to behave in exactly the same way. And we ourselves have had 
inquiries and reviews conducted uh, by um, experts. And the experts have found them guilty of bad practice, unfair practice, uh, uh, incorrect decision making. And these were all put to them. But somehow, again, we, we, got, we, got a, we got that sort of satisfaction in a way that the councils, etc., and the planning were found guilty. But nothing happened. Nothing changed. And this is why people are frustrated. You may have noticed in some of my documentation to you, I use the word frustration and hurt. And this is why there's, there's frustration and hurt, and this should not be the case. Okay. Mr Hillage. Thanks, Chair. And you're very welcome this afternoon, folks. We've been very interesting so far. Probably bypassed my question, the line of question, but I mean, it was about really consistency across all the councils, which, as a former councillor, had to take some action myself then to try and highlight the inconsistencies. And I'm sure you folk with 60 organisations must see a huge amount of inconsistency across the councils. Is that the case? And further to that, there are some councils now being led the planning area by people who came out of enforcement, for instance. Would those be better led councils than maybe somebody just coming in from a planning consultancy or taking up employment with a council of sort of you, do you find that the enforcement people who are heading up councils maybe have that wee bit more sort of clout with their councillors, as it were? I don't know, because on that second part of the question, I don't know, because I'm not sure yeah, which councils yeah. are, are headed up by the enforcement. I, mm -hmm. I tend to sort of just focus on, on the, the areas that are yeah. causing me problems at, at the time, but I'm sure maybe, maybe somebody else might have a, a view on that. And consistency is a massive problem, and I think you're always going to expect it <coughs> when... Um, you could go to 11 councils, but you shouldn't expect you shouldn't. inconsistency of approach when it's about administrative processes. And there's massive inconsistency, for instance, I think somebody had mentioned earlier about putting key documents on the planning portal. I have, been, I have been asking since 2014, including in the Northern Ireland Assembly when it was before when the, with the Minister, to please put documents that, that you're re legally required to hold by law, like the environmental impact assessment determinations, <coughs> that's regulation assessments, which are absolutely key to the public understanding how decisions are making. I suppose, sorry, just to interrupt you there, some of those people you've mentioned there who should be consulting with the planners, they still have a sort of a silo attitude as well, and there are long delays in getting some of those legal documents back again too. Well, these are these are when I say these are not these are not legal documents that are that are prepared by either the plan the planners prepare the um, environmental impact assessment screenings and their shared environmental services prepare and, and there are there can be delays in in getting the uh, habitats regulations back and there are massive delays in actually carrying out the environmental uh, assessment process the EIA screening process. It should be done within four weeks of the planning application, yeah. um, or 90 days, or, or a, a longer time agreed, no more than 90 days, in writing with the applicant. What we're finding is those screenings are being done a week before the application is approved, so it might be four or five years into the decision, and then they do them. Um, I've I come across one very recently where it was done on the day that the, the decision was sent out. Um, and so that's why that's one part of the reason why they're not being put on the, the planning portal. I suppose if they're going to, if they're doing them so late, but where they have done them, again they're not making their way onto the, the planning portals in a timely manner, and that's very disadvantageous to the public. Okay. Thank you much. Ms. Harvey, would you like to? Um, no, I was just going to reiterate that some there, there does does seem to be variation in how the AI regulations are interpreted and, and uh, enforced, um, and enforcement varies a great deal from place to place and from council to council, and I guess, I mean, from our point of view, that's just not acceptable. Why should something be okay in, in one part of Northern Ireland and, and not, not okay somewhere else? Mm, okay. Yep. Thank you, Sue. Yep. No, thank you. That's that you. Okay. Um, Mr Irwin. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, and I kind of thank you for your presentation. Your early presentation you mentioned it was mentioned a number of times that there's professional corruption what exactly do you mean by that um it can vary but i, I would suggest that it's sustained patterns of unethical conducts that are very clear to everybody but are being denied um simply through the abuse of power so that as the public 
We have no authority. We, we, can, we can carry out our investigations as far as we can, and we can come up with conclusions. We can even find hard evidence. But we can't come in and interview staff. We can't come in and find out what has gone on. So what then happens is these unethical practices whereby we're, 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 we're at the dead end where the authorities say we've acted appropriately. They can't explain how. They won't explain how. And the reason why they can't explain how is because they know they haven't acted appropriately. But the fact is that that's the wall we come up against. And that's the unethical conduct, un, un, unethical conduct by not being <coughs> open and transparent and indeed and sometimes misleading in, in respect of their, their engagements with members of the public. Any, any of the rest of you want to be just, no. just, just really on, Mr. William, Mr. Irwin, sorry. No, I mean, in our experience, failure to answer key questions at key moments in time has made a massive, massive difference to how things have unfolded. Um, and I would say that's intentional. I would say that if you deliberately ignore the first point in someone's letter and answer the second, and then you wait until the thing has happened before you then admit that you actually did have the power in the first place, that's not okay. You know, what's that all about? So, yeah, that's, that definitely raises the public suspicion that something is going on. And, and you know, if, if it's okay for some people not to follow the rules, why should anyone follow the rules? You know, we've got to be consistent. Okay. Mr. McLaughlin, did you want to come in? Um, can I say? Sorry, go ahead. So, sorry, will, sorry, William. Um, I just want Mr. No. McLaughlin to come in and then I'll bring you back. Don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to exclude you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Irwin, do you want no, to No, no, go ahead, you, yourself. Um, what I was going to say there, um, the, the Dean and Anne have kind of answered that quite well. But the, the, big, the, big, the, big, the big issue is that people in general and the public in general are so dissatisfied with the planning system that the planning system, we talk about maybe little things, introducing little things and, and various things that might make a difference. That we're, that we can't actually talk about things that are kind of. I've been doing this for a long number of years, and somehow things things don't, just do not change. It goes on and on and on. And okay, on. is it is it worse now than it was? I mean, you, you said that you would expect when you go from 26 to 11, you know, that things. I would have thought when you go from 26 to 11, it would improve. I would have thought. I mean, that, why else would you do it? <laughs> I. You know, I mean, do, do you think it's better? Or? I, I was one of those people who lobbied for, for democratic change. Okay. But it, I must say, it's worse now than before. <laughs> right. Now, the other thing, what I say is. Hope you're not advocating what, what, North what, Korea. What, 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 what I would just like to finish off by saying, and we're, we're, I know we're running time short, but uh, there's so much that is dissatisfaction, frustration, and all the rest that uh, that will sort of. Sticking plaster ideas just will not work. Okay. Okay. We need, and, and had, uh, this I actually noted when, um, from my business kind of point of view, the, the actual, the, the model that the, our planning system is based on is wrong. Yeah. It's, it's, it's obsolete. The whole thing is obsolete. It needs complete change. We need to bring a completely independent um, group of people or a team of people who are what, what I call change masters. That will actually kind of come in and, and just do whatever has to be done okay. to make the, the, the system better, more credible system, more honest system, a more fair system. Okay, Mr. Irwin, you wanted to come back. Well, uh, yes, I did, and uh, a couple of issues. And one is, I think professional corruption is unfair. For uh, it paints everyone in the planning service into that corner, and I don't think it's very fair to do that because I deem, uh, in my capacity as an MLA with planners, and I have never met. Uh, planners that have been corrupt. Uh, in my experience, many of them do work very hard and uh, they have a very difficult job. And planning is open to interpretation in many issues. And uh, as uh, the, by going to the Peelers Commission, you you find that out in some situations. You also accuse planners of, of not dealing properly with the environment, but surely they, they consult with the Northern Ireland Environment, environment Agency on, on all those major issues. Is using the take their guide from Northern Ireland Environment Agency, am I right? Well, if I could take the first point, uh, and maybe Anne might want to address the second point, but the, in terms of the professional corruption, I made very clear at the outset that there are many good planners equally as frustrated with the system, but afraid to raise points uh, for various reasons. And the, so from that perspective, it's not directed or trying to paint every planner, 
uh, with the same brush. Not at all. I am a planner myself, and I know the pressures that many plan. Or not anymore. Well, I don't work anymore uh, as planning, but the, the, the pressures that they face and the, and the difficulties within that. Professional corruption is a specific term. It's, de it's de defined by an author called Samuels, and it's about unethical conducts within public service. It's not about it, it's. But it is defined as professional corruption. And any public servant that engages in unethical conducts could be deemed to be engaging in professional corruption under that academic definition. And if I could just sort of chip in there. Regarding you know, corruption, it's, it's cultural change that I think that George was referring to mm. earlier on. That's what's required. It's how you, you treat people. Um, <laughs> And, and how that process works, how efficient that process is. And just to answer your second point on EIA's, and you mentioned that, that it was NIEA's role to sort of oversee that. Um, NIEA don't have anything to do with historic environments. Um, and in our case, we're dealing with a historic environment which um, requires an environmental impact assessment. So it's much, much broader than saying it, it's something that the planners should have you know, properly understood and interpreted in the early days, rather than what we are now seeing, which is an attempt to kick the ball down as far down the line as possible until someone else sorts it out um, without simply saying, OK, let's draw a line and fix the thing. Um, so I think it's, it's that cultural change of actually, you know, sort of integrity that, that I feel is, 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 is often lacking. And I would really welcome a cultural change within the planning system. Mm -hmm. OK, is that you, Mr Irwin? Hello, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Ms. Clay, you wanted to add something, did you? <clears throat> yeah, um, I was just going to say I um, have a definition of the term professional corruption from the works of Samuels, if anybody wanted me to read it out, because when I first heard the term as well, I was, um, you know, I wondered what it meant, but um, it said, simply put, professional uh, corruption refer to observable symptoms that manifest in distinct patterns of abnormal behavior, unethical conducts, have the ability to harm the organization's reputation, tend to persist, generate tensions among its members, and antagonism between the organization and the public. If not addressed, these corruptions and pathologies become contagious within organizations, deeply penetrate their culture, and require concealment from the public gaze. Perhaps the most concerning pathology for any public authority is the unavoidable abandonment of public service values that comes with the decision to conceal neglectful practice. So that came out of that book um, that Dean referred to. And, you know, I, I, I would just reiterate what he said. It's not all planners. You know, some people in there, you know, wanting to make great change. Um, but it's the overall patterns and behaviours and how it impacts on members of the public or information that's not available, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think all of the members who wanted to ask questions have now had that opportunity. I would like to thank all of you for coming along uh, and giving of your time uh, and your experience and expertise today. Uh, it's much appreciated. helps us get a more holistic and rounded um, uh, inquiry report when we do produce it. Uh, we do hope to be in a position uh, to publish it on the 22nd of this month. Um, it's very clear in this uh, inquiry, Lou Short, it's been very clear for us so far that the system is disjointed and it's not working, that there is a standardisation problem uh, and there's a huge issue around, um, if there isn't an issue around capacity, which I personally believe there is, there's clearly a huge issue around confidence uh, in terms of uh, planning in Northern Ireland. Um, so. The, the audit office have been here present during uh, the uh, presentation you've made, which is now, of course, on the record. So thank you very much indeed, and uh, we really appreciate your thank taking the time to be here. Thanks with so us. much. Thank you. Okay, members, with your permission, then we will go into closed session to consider the evidence session um, and broadcasting. Can you confirm if we are now, in fact, in closed session? Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate.